Thank you for listening to the History of the Papacy. I'm Steve, and we are a member of the Agora Podcast Network. We are on Facebook and Twitter, and you can find both by searching for A2Z History. If you have any questions, comments, or feedback, you can always send me an email to my email address, steve at a2zhistorypage.com. Speaking of the Agora Podcast Network, the Agora Podcaster of the Month is Reconsider, and you can learn more about that podcast at agorapodcastnetwork.com. Let us quickly commemorate the patreon.com forward slash history of the papacy patrons on the history of the papacy diptychs. We have Yorin at the Alexandria level and Paul the Magnificent at the Constantinople level. Thank you for all of you who have signed up. The new and improved history of the papacy Patreon is very similar to the old Patreon, but even better. At different levels, there's book drawings and a lot of really cool things, especially the um, Nom de Podcast, I guess you'd call them, sobriquets like the Magnificent and the Great. You can follow the link in the show notes or search for History of the Papacy on Patreon to find more. And one new great benefit I forgot to mention is you will receive audio of the YouTube-only exclusive, The History of the Papacy in 10 Minutes. You can watch them on my YouTube channel, The History of the Papacy, and then listen to them on the Patreon bonus feed. Look for those episodes to premiere on YouTube really soon. I have a couple of them recorded, a couple of them edited, uh, a bunch of them written and in the process. It's a, a lot of fun, and I think you'll really enjoy them. Today we have a bit of a different episode. This is the entire audio of the Pilgrimage of Etheria audiobook that I mentioned in episode 102. The entire audio is available on LibriVox. LibriVox is an incredible resource for public domain books that have been generously narrated and uploaded to the site. I found the, uh, the way the book was formatted to be a bit clunky. So I edited it together, made some adjustments to some sounds here and there to make the listening experience a bit easier for podcasts and YouTube's uh, listeners and subscribers. This version of The Pilgrimage of Etheria also features an introduction by the translator M. L. McClure. Etheria's Pilgrimage is an incredible story, and I hope you enjoy. There's a lot of discussion. Uh, the, the translator brings up a lot of interesting issues, and I would love to hear what you think about her journey. This book would actually be an excellent book study, a history of the papacy book study. Maybe we do that on Twitter or Facebook or something. Send me an email if you're interested in joining. Now we begin The Pilgrimage of Etheria audiobook by LibriVox. Section 1 of The Pilgrimage of Etheria. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Wales. The Pilgrimage of Etheria by Etheria. Introduction, the Narrative, and Its Authorship. This book was discovered by Signor Garmarini in a manuscript of the 11th century at Arezzo, and he published it first in 1887, and again in a corrector edition in 1888. Three years later, an English translation with text and notes by Dr. J. H. Bernard and an appendix on the topography by Sir C. W. Wilson appeared under the auspices of the Palestine Pilgrims Text Society. In 1895, Dom Cabral issued a treatise of some importance entitled Les Églises de Jerusalem. Then came Monsieur Paul Gaillet's edition in 1898 in volume 34 of the Vienna Corpus Script Ecclesiae Latina, who still further amended and elucidated the text. Up till that time, Signor Gamarini's conjecture that the authoress was Sylvia of Aquitaine, sister of the Emperor Theodosius Minister Rufinus, had been considered plausible, but had not been either corroborated or disproved. But in 1903, Dom Ferretin, Revue des Questions Historiques, Volume 74, 
sought to identify her with the virgin named Etheria, mentioned by Valerius in a letter to the religious brethren of the Bezzo in northwest Spain, and his arguments have met with very general acceptance. In 1909, however, a detailed and determined attack upon his views was made by Karl Meister in the Rheinisches Museum, so far as the date and nationality of the pilgrim are concerned. But his arguments were in Monseigneur Duquesne's opinion, successfully met and answered by the Abbe de Conique Revue Biblique, 1910, and others. No one probably now adheres to the theory that Sylvia was the pilgrim. Meister himself agrees with the other scholars already mentioned, who have identified her with the abbess named Etheria, to whom Valerius refers. He only disputes her date and nationality. Dom Ferretin's theory, amounting almost to a certainty, was that she was a fellow countrywoman of Valerius, who had visited the East towards the end of the fourth century, i.e. in the reign of Theodosius, died 395. Valerius himself lived in the second half of the seventh century and is chiefly known as the biographer of his contemporary St. Fructusius, Bishop of Braga. He was abbot of the Monasterium Rufianensens near Astorga in the mountainous district of Galicia, now called the Verzo. In the letter mentioned above, he speaks of Etheria as extremo exedui maris oceani litori exota, sprung from the farthest shores of the western sea, the ocean, chapter 4, while a doubtful phrase, where the true reading is uncertain in chapter 1, seems nevertheless almost necessarily to connect Etheria with the extremitas vis oxidia plaga, the farthest part of this western coast. If huis occurred in the first of these two expressions, the inference that she was from Galicia would be certain. As it is, the phrases are so similar that very little doubt can be entertained that she was. Meister, however, maintains that they do not of necessity indicate this district, and that inter alia, as her language exhibits no trace of the Spanish dialect, but distinct traces of that of Galia Narbonensis, and as she refers to the river Rhone, on page 31, as if it were familiar both to herself and her readers, she came from southeast Gaul, and that her monastery was perhaps at Marseille or Arles, where there were well-known religious houses in the 6th century, to which he assigns her pilgrimage, viz. in the first half of the reign of Justinian, died 565. A considerable portion of Meister's argument rests upon the language used by Etheria. He goes into minute details over her usages, and the upshot of his examination is that she was not unlearned, but was familiar with the scriptures, to the language of which her own is similar, her phrases being often suggested by, or formed from, the same. This seems to him to point to a later date and a different nationality than the one we have accepted. We, too, do not think she was for her time and country badly educated and unlearned nor unfamiliar with the scriptures. No one could think that. But making all possible allowances for the inaccuracies of the scribe to whom we owe our knowledge of her narrative, and they are probably serious and frequent, yet the fact remains that she wrote a very slipshod Latin. Her deficiencies cannot all be due to the carelessness or ignorance of the copyist. And this is the more surprising because, though she does not appear to have picked up any Syriac or other native tongue in her journeys, yet she is by no means without knowledge of Greek, for she uses quite a large number of Greek words and phrases, and transliterates them as a rule with accuracy. See list on page 48 following. Besides that, she displays great intelligence and exercises great powers of observation and appreciation of what she sees and hears wherever she goes, and this makes her narrative always lively and entertaining, in spite of the defects in her style and occasional obscurity of meaning. Stress has been laid, and not without reason, on the indications of Etheria's social importance which her story affords. Wherever she went, she was well received and entertained by bishops, clergy, and monks, who spared no pains in acting as Citeroni to her. She was provided with escorts of Roman soldiers when passing through a disturbed and dangerous district between Sinai and Egypt, page 14, but dispensed with their services when it was no longer necessary to trouble them. 
page 17. Though she often uses the first person singular as the head of the pilgrimage, yet she no less often speaks of we and us in a way that serves to show that she traveled with a certain retinue of her own. While in the journey to Mount Sinai, she was also accompanied by certain holy guides, deductores, and again when she went to Mount Nebo. The cost of this expedition from west to east and back again, which occupied several years, must have been great, however abundant the hospitality was which she met with. In the return from Mount Sinai to Clisma, Suez, she mentions the animals she used. These were apparently not camels, for she immediately speaks of them by name as used by the natives of Paran. But for the first part of the ascent of Mount Nebo, east of Jordan, she was able to use Aselus, an ass or mule, whereas she had to walk all the way up Mount Sinai, not even Asela, litter, being possible, because of its great steepness. If she had been an ordinary pilgrim in those days, she would have been content to go on foot the whole way. Such considerations, again, were amongst those which led earlier editors to identify our pilgrim, as has been said above, with either Gala Placidia or with Sylvia of Aquitaine. But though there is a certain amount in Sylvia's case that fits in with what is here contained, yet the terms in which the Lausiac history of Palladius speaks of her in connection with her journey from Jerusalem to Egypt show that she was an aesthetic of the most severe type in her practices, and that our pilgrim never shows herself to have been, however much she respects and admires asceticism in those she meets or visits. Three other matters remain to be considered which bear upon the dates of the narrative, besides being of general interest. A. Etheria speaks of the three bishops whom she came across in Mesopotamia, at Bathne, Edessa, and Haran, as conspicuous for their holiness, being both monk and confessor, in each case. She does not apply this word confessor to any other of the bishops, although she has several times noted that they were, or had been, monks formerly, while the still vigorous old priest whom she saw on Mount Sinai had been both a monk from an early age and, as they say here, an ascete. According to Monsignor Duquesne, we know that the three bishops, who are called confessors, were victims of the persecution under Valens, A.D. 367-378, page 547. We can hardly be said to know this, but only that this is more likely that they were, other things being considered, than that they were those whom the Emperor Anastasius, favoring the Monophysites, drove out in the early years of the 6th century, as Meister maintains. Is it, however, altogether certain that confessor in these three cases means more than a stricter ascete than an ordinary monachus? Duquesne himself recognizes that this is a frequent meaning of the title in those days. See Christian Worship, page 142, 173, 284, and 420. And Bradesol, East du Breve, Rome, page 57. Still, Eulogius, bishop of Edessa, died 388, seems to have suffered persecution, and this would no doubt fit in with our date for the pilgrimage. B. Etheria quotes the bishop of Haran's statement to her that at that time the Persians held the district of Nisibus and Ur, and the Romans had no place there, page 39. As the emperor Jovian had yielded the district to King Sapor in 363, that seems to be the explanation of the statement. On the other hand, in the years 540-545, the Romans, under Belisarius, regained their supremacy in the east, so that Meister allows that the pilgrimage must have taken place before then. For that reason, among others, he assigns it to 534 or thereabouts. C. Dr. Bernard has drawn our attention to another point in favor of the earlier date, which Meister seems to have overlooked. It is this. When we come to the pilgrimages, which are admittedly of the 6th century, e.g. the so-called Breviarum and the pilgrimage of Theodosius, both of which may be dated about 530, we find among the churches in Jerusalem visited by pilgrimage St. Peter in the house of Caiaphas and St. Sophia in the Praetorium. 
Etheria knows nothing of these. She names only the Martyrium, the Anastasis, and the Church of Zion, and as her description of the holy city is rich in detail, it may be reasonably concluded that these were the only churches which she saw, and that her visit was prior to the erection of those named by Theodosius. Meister uses a similar argument to prove that the pilgrimage must be prior to the building by Justinian of the Church of St. Mary Dipara in 543, as it certainly was. But this reasoning is equally conclusive to establish its priority to the Breviarium and the Peregrinatio Theodosii, the present edition and its editors. That part of the text which relates to Jerusalem had been translated for the English version, second edition, of Duquesne's Origines du Culte Chrétien, which Mrs. McClure published in 1904. For it she was mainly indebted, as she tells us, to her brother, the Reverend George Herbert, who had the advantage of many criticisms and suggestions from so eminent a scholar as the late canon Charles Evans, formerly headmaster of King Edward's School, Birmingham. Mr. Herbert also translated the rest of the text, which now appears with the same assistance. Moreover, he read through K. Meister's book on the subject, and made a careful resume of his conclusions for her, of which use has been freely made in this introduction. Most of the footnotes were added to the text by Mrs. McClure herself, a few by the present writer. But though the results of their joint labors had been set up in print for some time, and she had spent a good deal of time in further research and thought over them with a view to writing the introduction, she had to lay the work aside while she was completing the fifth edition of Christian Worship, and seeing it through the press. This she had hardly done when she was called away, just as she was intending to resume her work on the pilgrimage of Etheria last summer, 1918. There are many reasons why we mourn her loss, and surely among them we must reckon this, that we are not now permitted to share with her the joy of seeing the fruits of her long study brought to completion. She left very few materials for the introduction behind among her papers, and though the present writer has in all cases done his best to utilize what there was and to reproduce what he thought to be in her mind on various points, yet he has had very largely to start de novo in drawing up the introductory sections, and to treat the text more or less independently. He must be forgiven, therefore, if he has failed sometimes to do justice to her ideas and to the researches on which she had so long been engaged, and if there is a certain amount of confusion in arrangement and of discrepancy between her part of the volume and his." Mrs. McClure had frequently discussed points with friends of considerable expert knowledge like Archbishop Bernard, Monseigneur Duquesne, Professor Flinders Petrie, and others, and sometimes mentions them by name in her notes as having told her this or that. The first named of these had written a short foreword to the volume in September 1916, but he has requested the present writer to withdraw it as being no longer suitable to its purpose and to use the additional facts that he there gave in his own introduction. This he has been very glad to do, and begs to acknowledge his indebtedness to his grace for them, as well as to others, who have contributed to the production of the book in its present form, and in particular to the Rev. A. D. Rigby, who has read through the proofs and made several valuable suggestions, which he has been able to adopt. Etheria's Route to and from Constantinople we have, of course, no hint of the route taken by Etheria from her home in the extreme west of Europe as far as Constantinople and back again, unless her mention of the river Rhone be taken as indicating that she crossed it in her journey, possibly at Arles. But it is interesting to note that nearly fifty years before her, the anonymous Pilgrim of Bordeaux gives the route which she pursued, and that may possibly have been Etheria's too. She went out by land, she tells us, across the north of Italy, through Noricum, Pannonia, Moisi, Dacia, and Thrace, while on her return she embarked at Olan in Epirus and crossed the South Adriatic to Hydruntum, Otranto, and reached home by Rome and Milan. End of section one.
Section two of the Pilgrimage of Etheria by Etheria. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Introduction Resume of her journeyings. The narrative, as we now possess it, opens in the middle of a sentence at the point where the pilgrim had already reached the megalithic remains at Kibroth Atava, in sight of the mountain range of Sinai. It may reasonably be assumed that the missing part contained the account of her journey from her western home to Constantinople, from thence through what is now Asia Minor to Antioch and on to Jerusalem. The events of her stay there, apart from the description of the services, which she gives later on at page forty five and following and her journey from thence towards mount sinai by way of clisma now suez and Ferran or paran she had just before probably ascended the mountain of Ferran, where the hands of moses were uplifted during the battle with amalekat exodus seventeen ten following and came down again into the plain see page twenty two below by this time the mountains lie only four miles distant and passing along the wide flat valley that lies between they soon arrive at their foot on the western side sir c w wilson has no doubt that the peak which she calls the mount of god and made a point of ascending was jebel musa the traditional site seven thousand three hundred and sixty three feet high though it would actually be impossible for her to see what she was told she saw from the top page six like so many tourists she was misinformed she went also to what she was told was mount oreb where elijah's cave was and there she specially mentions the very earnest prayer with which they made the oblation thence they descended on the eastern side to the place of the burning bush where the present convent of st catherine is and after visiting tabara and several other sites she returned down the valley again to faran and so back after two days rest by a toilsome route across the desert to clisma where she was again glad to rest for a while when she had been in egypt before she had seen something of goshen as well as of the tibad and alexandria but she was now desirous to explore the route of the exodus more carefully she found it was no easy journey of four stations across the desert to what she calls the city of arabia identified by experts with the thou of roman official documents or possibly bubastir and the district was apparently at the time unsettled and in military occupation however she was allowed an escort of soldiers and set out the route lay past apolium by Hararath, where there was a roman garrison then through two other forts migdal and baal zephon and onwards by way of etham succoth pithom another fort to heroopolis then only a large village on a branch of the nile and within the borders of egypt the remainder of the journey into goshen was then accomplished it took her past rameses which was only four miles from her goal the city of arabia which she reached on the eve of the epiphany in time for the services here she sent back her military guard as she was now on the high road from the thebaid to pelusium and would have no difficulty when she resumed her journey towards palestine at rameses saft el hene which was once a great city she found nothing but ruins remaining except two great statues cut out of one great theban stone and an ancient sycamore famous for its healing virtue which they called the tree of truth according to the bishop of arabia who had come out to meet her there his account also was that pharaoh had burnt the place to the ground in anger at the israelites escape etheria's route lay for two days right through the land of goshen along the banks of the nile and she was greatly struck with the fertility and beauty of this district in an article by miss amelia betham edwards which appeared in harper's magazine october eighteen eighty six we read the following interesting comments on this this was before the submerging of the field of zoan by lake menzela mazudi the arab traveller and historian of the tenth century thus describes it the place occupied by the lake was formerly a district which had not its equal in egypt for fine air fertility and wealth 
gardens plantations of palms and other trees vines and cultivated fields met the eye in every direction in short there was not a province in egypt except the fayum to be compared with it for beauty this district was distant about one day's journey from the sea but in the year 251 of the era of Diocletian, A.D. 535, the waters of the sea flowed in and submerged that part of the plain which now is called the Lake of Tennis, and every year the inundation increased so that at last it covered the whole province. We know that the late Mrs. McClure considered this an additional cooperation of her conviction that Meister's date for the pilgrimage was wrong, and it is certainly a remarkable sidelight on the narrative if the date and the other statements are to be relied on. Between the city of Arabia and Pelusium on the sea coast, she mentions only one place that she passed through, viz. Tatnus, which is taken as more likely to be the ancient Taphanes or Daphno than Tanis Zoan. But the two places were not far apart, and the relevancy of the extract just given is not affected. Without further description of her journey, Etheria arrived once more in Jerusalem. She now proceeds to describe another expedition she undertook from there, viz. to make the ascent of Mount Nebo in the land of Moab. This time she was accompanied by several of the clergy and monks. They crossed the Jordan by Jericho, and passing through Livias, came to the mountain, and having reached the top, were much delighted with the panorama spread before them, particulars of which she gives. They then returned to the holy city. Her next tour was through Jericho again, and then northwards up the Jordan Valley, until they came first to Salem, where they visited Melchizedek's church and city, then to Ainan, Thisbe, Elijah's native place, and the brook Cherith, and so, crossing the Jordan, into the Asitis Uz, where they made the burying place of Job at Carneas, or Deneba, the final point of their journey." The church had been built by some tribune, but left unfinished. Here again, Etheria refers to the thankfulness and joy with which she and her companions made their communion at the special oblation which the bishop offered at her request before they returned once more to Jerusalem. But there is a gap in the manuscript in the middle of the account of this tour. After leaving the brook Cherith, they continued up the valley until they saw on the left towards Phoenicia, on the northwest, a great and very high mountain which extended and there the gap begins, and when the story is taken up again, we are at Job's burial place. Valerius, chapter 2, mentions several mountains as visited by her, which are omitted in our fragments, Pharon, where Moses prayed with hands uplifted, but that no doubt she described before our fragments begin, page 1. Tabor, the scene of our Lord's transfiguration, Hermon, where the Lord was wont to rest himself with his disciples, and the mountain where our Lord taught his disciples the Beatitudes, etc. The shape of Tabor, which is conical and not very high, does not suit Etheria's description. One would think, therefore, that it was part of the Hermon range that she saw, and that by the time she saw it, she had returned east to cross the Jordan. The time had now come for Etheria to return to her own country, but still full of energy and desire to see as much as she could, she determined to make a big detour from Antioch, which would lie in her direct course by land to Constantinople, and visit from there several important and interesting places in northwest Syria and Mesopotamia, before turning her face westwards. Accordingly, when she left Antioch, she went first to Hierapolis, and from there reached the great river Euphrates, which she can only compare with the Rhone for its width and strong current. They crossed it in a ship and came to Bethne in Azurn, and from thence arrived at Edessa, the chief goal of her desires, where she stayed three days and had a busy and very interesting time. Matters of interest are involved in this portion of the narrative, which deserve attention. Etheria expressly says she went to Edessa to pray at the martyrium of St. Thomas the Apostle, whose whole body is there. And when she arrived there, she and her companions went at once to the church and the martyrium of St. Thomas. She found the great and beautiful church had been rebuilt in a new form, Nova Compositione. This the Emperor Valens had finished in 372. 
Sacra hist ecle 418. Her language seems, though not at all certainly, to imply that the martyrium was still separate from the church. The Chronicle of Edessa says the tomb was transferred to the new church in 394, when Cyrus was bishop, who had succeeded Eulogius on his death in 388. This again seems to corroborate the date we have accepted for her pilgrimage. She visited many other martyria in the town, but makes no specific allusion to the famous likeness of our Lord, though it is said to have been held in veneration at least as early as the middle of the 4th century. She does, however, describe two other striking likenesses which she was taken to see, though that can hardly be more than a coincidence, viz. the marble busts or images, Archaeotype, of King Agbar and his son Magnus in the royal palace, page 33. Etheria gives us likewise an account that will be read with interest of what she was told about the letters of Abgar to our Lord and his answer. This account differs from that of Eusebius, Ister Ecclesia 2.13, in mentioning the promise of Christ that no enemy should ever enter the city. Eusebius knows nothing of such a promise of immunity, though later historians relate it. See Bernard's note, page 36, and it was known to Ephraim Cyrus, about 390. She also mentions that she had copies of these letters at home. Meister points out that Rufinus's translation of Eusebius Historia Ecclesia into Latin was not complete before 398 at the earliest, from which he argues that copies would not be known in the West so soon as the date assigned by Gamurini and adopted by ourselves. But there may have been other sources or authorities, Greek as well as Latin, besides Eusebius, nor was Etheria perhaps quite so ignorant of Greek as is usually thought, and her copies may have been in that language after all. From Edessa she went on to Haran and stayed there two days, one of them being April 24, the festival of St. Helpidius, see note on page 37. She would very much have liked to penetrate farther east to Nisibus and then on to Ur of the Chaldees, but the bishop dissuaded her on the ground that that district was now in the hands of the Persians, no longer the Romans. See page 39. She was content, therefore, to go only six miles out and see the well from which Jacob watered Rachel's flocks at a place called Fadana, the Padan Aram of Genesis 28.2. She then returned to Antioch and pursued her westward journey through Cilicia till she came to Tarsus. Here she made another detour by way of Pompeiopolis or Soli and Coricus, both on the seacoast, in order to pay a special visit to the tomb of St. Thecla in Isuria, where she met, to her great delight, her dear friend Marthana, whom she had known in Jerusalem. See note on page 29. Coming back to Tarsus, she made her way without further delay by Mopsacrine, which she calls Mansocrine, and under Mount Taurus, through Cappadocia, Galatia, and Bithynia, until she arrived at Chalcedon, and stopped there for the famous shrine of St. Euphemia, and finally arrived at Constantinople. There she visited the Church of the Apostles, page 44, and many other of the martyria with which the city abounded, and still indefatigable, tells her beloved sisters that while she is preparing this narrative for them there, and also, it seems, drawing up her account of the services and rites which she had witnessed at Jerusalem, she will not actually leave her home till she has crossed into Asia once again, and visited the martyrium of St. John at Ephesus. If anything further remains to tell, and her life is spared, she will relate it in person or in another letter. And so she brings her story to an end, which investigation proves to be as veracious as it is undoubtedly vivacious throughout. End of section 2 Section 3 of The Pilgrimage of Etheria by Etheria. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Introduction. Ecclesiastical Organization. 
Etheria practically gives no description and makes no comment on the church organization of the district through which she journeyed, except that she mentions, one, the bishops and other clergy whom she met, often saying that they had been, or still were, from among the ranks of the monastic orders, and, two, the churches in which they ministered. At the end of the fourth century, Egypt was an independent province under the Patriarch of Alexandria, but the part of Egypt she mostly mentions would hardly have been organized by that time into what afterwards became known as Augustanica Prima, with fourteen bishops, the chief of whom was at Pelusium. The Bishop of Jerusalem had had special privileges granted him at the Council of Nicaea, 325, but he was still under the jurisdiction of his provincial metropolitan the bishop of caesarea duquesne opsit page twenty seven and therefore probably the clergy west of the jordan she had to do with outside the holy city were likewise dependent on the latter to the east and northeast of the jordan as far as hierapolis page thirty one the places she visited were probably all in the domain of the patriarch of antioch while those in mesopotamia would be under the catholicus of armenia the monks and nuns of the narrative it is a matter of common knowledge that monasticism took its rise in egypt about the middle of the third century perhaps as the result of the decian persecution many of those who then fled to the desert never returning and that from the beginning of the fourth century the movement developed mainly along two lines which were almost contemporaneous one under the method of St. Anthony, whose monks were mostly solitary hermits in the strict sense, though in some places they lived near one another in small companies and met together for common worship on Saturdays and Sundays. Two under the rule of St. Pacomius, who founded the conventual type of monasticism. Here the brethren lived together in much larger bands and not only combined for common worship, but were organized for regular work on the land, etc., though they took no meals together and were each allowed to practice that amount of austerity which his strength and zeal prompted, beyond the fixed minimum which was obligatory on all. Thus, the spirit of individualism was a strongly marked feature in both these systems. It was from Egypt, by way of Rome, that monasticism was quite early brought to Western Europe, and there, for some time, it retained many of its more especially Eastern characteristics. The community of feeling and atmosphere, therefore, between the monastic institutions of the West and those of Egypt, Syria, and Palestine, was considerable, and will account for the readiness with which it was received everywhere on her journeys and for the highly appreciative way in which she commends the saintliness of her entertainers and informants who were in the greater number of instances closely associated with the monastic and ascetic life the rule of st pacomius which sprang into a full organization almost at once like minerva from the head of jove spread rapidly but into palestine the monastic life was introduced early in the fourth century not by him but by a disciple of st antony hilarion there the original impulse to the eremitic life survived and the cenobitic ideal made little headway either now or later in Assyria and Mesopotamia, asceticism was, so to speak, indigenous. Consequently, most, if not all, the monks and nuns that Etheria met in Palestine, Syria, and Mesopotamia were probably either of the strictly eremitic or semi eremitic kind. See, for example, page 37. The names she uses to describe these monks and nuns are various. In the former part of the narrative, her regular name for them is Monarchy. We have already mentioned, page 13, the three instances where she also brings in the word ascites, hasketes, and the three doubtful instances of the use of the word confessor in connection with monks. The ascites whom she heard of or met at Carnes on the east of Jordan was evidently a solitary, and so probably was the priest on Mount Sinai. Also the monachus at Thisbe, it would seem, page 28. 
a number of them came into haran from the mesopotamia desert on the feast of saint helpidius april twenty four at seleucia in isaria we read for the first time of women virgines as well as men the former under the direction of a deaconess named marthana see page forty two whom she had previously met at jerusalem and also there she first uses the term apotactite which for her includes members of both sexes this term recurs several times at jerusalem where monazontes and parthenae are likewise mentioned monazontes should strictly denote solitaries but so should monarchy probably neither have always their strict significance in etheria's vocabulary the term apotactite seems to have been an unusual one for christian ascetics palladius in his lausiac history frequently uses the verb apotactite of those who renounce the pleasures and pursuits of the world and cassian gave his book the title de institutis renuncianeum where renunciantes bears the same sense but otherwise apotoctetes was one of the names assumed by such ascetic heretics as the manichaean encretates etc evidently however in etheria's usage it is more or less equivalent to monarchy monazontes and parthenae virgines and has not the least sinister association one other word which is connected with this subject needs a little explanation etheria constantly speaks of the monks monasteria it follows from what has been said that with her in the singular monasterium means a cell mostly that of a solitary and in the plural monasteria means a collection of cells where monks were living under semi-eremitic conditions more probably under the method of st anthony than under the rule of st pacomius thus the aged priest on mount sinai came out de monasterio zuo page four and the bishop of the city of arabia whom she had known ever since she was in the thebaide had been brought up in a passino from his boyhood in monasterio this man in passing is quite worthy of further notice because etheria tells us that in consequence he was both well learned in the scriptures and chastened in his whole life besides being courteous and most kind in receiving pilgrims truly a charming picture of an old world church dignitary for instances of monasteria collections of cells we may refer to what is said of them under mount sinai on page five where the monk's successful cultivation of the lower slopes is well described and again to those she visited around rachel's well near haran and the monasteria sine numero vivorum ac mulerium which she found surrounding the church at seleucia these last were all enclosed in a high wall which had been raised to protect them from the inroads of the brigands who infested the district page forty two etheria's use of the bible etheria's usual name for the bible is scriptura either in the singular or the plural and with or without the epithet holy twice she uses the expression the scriptures of god page sixteen and forty she characterizes the pentateuch from which she naturally quotes most often as the holy books of holy moses the most interesting of the titles she uses however is on page thirty eight scriptura canonis the scripture of the canon a title which is apparently almost unknown elsewhere Westcott, Canon of the New Testament, page 504 following, doubted whether Credner's term, Graphi Canonos, had any justification. He himself quoted from Amphilochius, circa 380, the following as the nearest approach to it. Readers note long Greek phrase, end note. But now Etheria, ex hypothesi, this writer's contemporary, has given us an even more exact equivalent as bishop westcott says canon here must mean the authoritative rule or standard by which the books have been ratified and approved in the church 
Her quotations and references to the books of the Old Testament usually give a close representation of the Greek of the Septuagint, although we may imagine from her imperfect knowledge of Greek that they are based on a pre-Vulgate Latin version, not on the Septuagint itself. The proper names, she quotes, are, as we have shown in the text, good instances of this, and to these we may add one which is perhaps the clearest of all. On page 26, her Quod Dologomor, cf. Genesis 14, represents almost exactly the Septuagint Codolomono, while our English Chedolaramor represents the Vulgate Chodoloramor. She has, however, made a slip in calling him King of Nations instead of King of Elam. See note in loco. There are a few variations or divergencies which are worthy of note, though it is, of course, doubtful how far they are due to carelessness in her own or her copyist transcription. The principal of these are as follows. 1. Page 8 following Exodus 3, 5. Coridiam colsiamenti, the latchet of thy shoe. Here the Septuagint only gives hupodime, but see Genesis 14.23 and St. Mark 1.7, which probably account for her version. The same reading is found in Origen, Latin works. 2. Page 9, Exodus 32.27, De Porta in Porta. Here we should no doubt read In Portam, Septuagint, Epi Pulem, as the ablative makes no sense. 3. Page 15, Genesis 47, 6. Etheria's rendering here represents exactly neither the Septuagint text nor the Vulgate, which are different from one another. She gives en meliori terra Egypti, where the Septuagint has en te beltitiste gen, Vulgate in optimo loco, and she adds in terra yethsan in terra arabiae, which the Septuagint omits, while the Vulgate reads entrade eis terum gesen. Probably Etheria's is meant to be only a loose paraphrase, not an exact translation. 4 and 5, pages 18 and 19, for the readings and the explanations of them in Deuteronomy 32.49 and 34.8, see notes in loco. 6, page 13, in quoting apparently Numbers 10.12 and 33.36, she gives this rendering, Filii Israel ambulaverunt iter suum to the Septuagint Exeon and Apekon, Vulgate profecti, but she is probably thinking rather of such phrases as poga este or poeste odon than the exact original, e.g., Proverbs 2.20, epoguanto, Vulgate ambilas, tebus agathas, 3.23, in epocune, Vulgate ambulabas, Tas hodus su, and Judges 17.8, tu hoense hodon. 7. Page 6. She follows a Septuagint version of 1 Kings 19.9, ti su eftutsai, quid tu hic, a reading which is found in Tertullian de Ienu 6. 8. Page 36. In Genesis 24.20, Etheria takes it for granted, as usual, that Abraham's eldest servant is the same as Eleazar of Damascus, 15.20, though it is merely an assumption. Again, on page 25, it appears that she accepted the identification of the Salem of Melchizedek, Genesis 14.18, with the place of that name near Sychar, not as others do with Jerusalem. C.F. Jerome ad Evangelim, paragraph 27, and Onim. Her statement on page 32 that Batanis, Batne, is mentioned in the Bible is, so far as we know, without foundation. Also, that Moses was born at Tafnes or Tatnes, page 17, and wrote the book of Deuteronomy in the plains of Moab, page 19. Her actual quotations from the New Testament are not very numerous, and the following are the only ones that need be commented on. 
one in st mark fourteen thirty eight page seventy two she omits and pray and renders enname by ne vulgate ut non two in st luke twenty two forty one page seventy one readers note extensive greek passage is not accessit the copyist mistake for abscessit if so it is probably a genuine reading of the latin version etheria used three in st john twenty twenty five page eighty three she has non credo nisi videro but the greek is eon me ido u me pistunas no doubt it is a brief paraphrase and not a quotation for in her reference to st john nineteen thirty on page seventy seven she uses the word redidet spiritum to represent pagedomen to numa a much more expressive phrase than the vulgate traditet spiritum was this again the reading of her latin text End of section three Section 4 of The Pilgrimage of Etheria by Etheria. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Introduction, The Lives of the Saints. Besides these frequent references to the Bible lessons, which describe the places she visited, and the actions of holy men, which are there connected with them, Etheria, on page 43, mentions in set terms the acts of St. Thecla as having been read by her or to her when she was at Seleucia. Her story, which is closely connected with that of St. Paul, is referred to by Tertullian de Bapt, 117, about A.D. 200, as well as by Hilary of Poitiers, and Jerome in the 4th century. The acts of Paul and Thecla were at one time almost looked upon as included in the canon. At Edessa also, she read, besides the usual Bible lessons, some things concerning St. Thomas himself, page 32. It is not certain what the reference here is. The well-known Acts of Thomas were a Gnostic document, not specially connected with Edessa, nor at all likely to be used by the Orthodox Etheria. The earlier legend made out that St. Thomas the Apostle sent Thaddeus to Edessa, the later version identified the two. Probably what Etheria read was either the Doctrina Apostolorum, or the Doctrina Adlaia, or the Greek Acta Thaddeae. So, again, in connection with what the bishop had quoted for her benefit at Haran, Sherei, she tells her beloved sisters that her informants were always most careful to quote from, and she to listen to, only the most reliable stories, whether from the scriptures themselves, or from the gesta mirabili of holy men, i.e. Sete, some of whom were dead and some still alive, page 39 points of liturgical interest one epiphany etheria leaves practically no room for doubt that both in egypt and in jerusalem the feast of the nativity was kept on january sixth not on december twenty five and this is in accordance with what we know to be the general usage of those churches otherwise our christmas day had distinctly a western origin not having been introduced into the east before three seventy five and that was at antioch Juvenal, bishop of Jerusalem, died 458, is said to have accepted it, but Cosmas Indicoplustes, a native of Egypt, in the first half of the 6th century, distinctly witnesses against its observance in Jerusalem then. For the vicissitudes in regard to Christmas, see Duquesne, Opsit, page 259 following, and Coniber, Rituala Arminiorum, page 512. 2. The Purification, February 14. Etheria's name for it is simply Quadragesima de Epiphiana, the fortieth day from Epiphany, the common name for it being Hypante, Hupapante, or Meeting, i.e. of the Holy Family, with Simeon and Anna. This is the earliest extant notice of it. Naturally, it would begin as a favorite local commemoration in the holy city, and thence it spread towards the west in the 6th century. 3. 
Lent at Jerusalem lasted eight weeks when Etheria was there, the forty days, or more strictly forty-one days, being made up by omitting all the eight Sundays and all the Saturdays except Easter Eve. This prolongation of the season is not mentioned elsewhere. But it may be noted that the retention of the Saturday as a festival, not in Lent only, was long general in the East, if not to some extent in the West. Etheria says that in Jerusalem they call quadragesima eote, i.e. eante, feast, but this is probably a mistake on her part due to her imperfect knowledge of Greek, eote, singular, being commonly used for the great yearly festival of Easter. 4. The observances of Holy Week are all of great interest in view of the early date of the record. They included the following. A. The children's waving of olive or palm branches on the Sunday. This again started in Jerusalem. B. The celebration of the communion in the late afternoon of Monday Thursday. For this practice, see further below on page 13. C. The adoration of the cross and the observance of the three hours on Good Friday. D. King Solomon's ring and the ancient anointing horn of the kings were also exhibited and venerated. 5. Ascension Day itself was kept, but without much ceremonial, and at Bethlehem, not in the Embomon, as one would have expected. Curiously enough, however, on the afternoon of Pentecost, page 87, meetings were held both in the Aeliona and in the Embomon, at which the Feast of the Ascension was again commemorated. 6. The following were the daily offices. A. Vigiliae Nocturnae, before dawn. B. Matins, at dawn. C. Ters, only in Lent. D. Sext, E. Non. F. Lucanar. Vespers. No mention is made of prime or compline. These services were open to all who wished to attend, but naturally the chief part of the congregation consisted of ascetics of both sexes. Monazontes et Parthenae, page 45. Three psalms and three prayers were said at each office, and Etheria was agreeably impressed with the, to her unfamiliar, practice of adapting psalms, prayers, and lessons to the special teaching of the season or place. She also speaks of hymns and antiphons being used. The practice of singing or saying hymns other than the Psalms of David in divine service was of very early origin, certainly in the East and almost as certainly in the West, so that in any case Etheria would not have been entirely unaccustomed to it. But in the 4th century, largely in consequence of the efforts of the Orthodox or Catholics to counteract the spread of Arian views by this means, hymn writing and singing had received a very great impetus, and such compositions, whether metrical as in the West, or merely rhythmical as in the East, had become a regular part of public worship throughout Christendom. Thus, at Constantinople, we know that St. Chrysostom had encouraged their use, and at Milan, St. Ambrose had himself written hymns for the purpose, while at Edessa the famous Syriac hymns of Ephraim belonged to about the same period, and were intended as a counterblast to the unsound teaching conveyed by the older songs of Bardesanes. With regard to the antiphons which Etheria mentions, it is difficult to say whether she means compositions strictly so called because they were sung antiphonally, or in a more general sense anthems as we call them, for both kinds were already probably in use. It is not necessary to repeat here what Mrs. McClure has said in her footnotes on page 46 by way of possible explanation of the obscure expression to approach the bishop's hand, which occurs frequently in Etheria's account of the services at Jerusalem. With regard to Etheria's use of the word Misa in her narratives, it must be remembered that it still has for her its original meaning of dismissal, and is so rendered in this translation. It does not seem to have been introduced into church phraseology much before the end of the fourth century, and she herself does not employ it till she begins to describe the services at Jerusalem, page 46 following. There she applies it to all kinds of meetings for public worship, 
bishop, and much more often to the daily or occasional offices than to the liturgy properly so called, where, however, she is careful to distinguish between the Misa Catechumenorum and the Misa Fidelium. Her usual terms for the Eucharist are oblatio and offere, and the congregation is usually said procedere for its celebration. One quite new feature of this edition, on which Mrs. McClure had spent much care, is the use that she has made in her notes of the old Armenian lectionary for the purpose of identifying the psalms and lections sung or said at Jerusalem during her visit. This evidence, says Archbishop Bernard, supplies an interesting confirmation of the accuracy of Etheria's observations as to the nature of the services at which she was present. For the frequent references in its rubrics to Jerusalem sites are shown to be genuine and to belong to an early period by the statements of more than one Armenian father in the first half of the 8th century. The information will be found set out in full in Mr. Conneby's Ritual of Armenorum, page 507 following. It is based upon two manuscripts, one at Paris in the Bibliothèque Nationale of the 8th century, the other at Oxford in the Bodleian of the 14th century, and upon the commentary of Gregory Ashirani, early 8th century. 7. Fasting Various details are given, in particular with regard to Wednesdays and Fridays in Lent, page 59, and the extra strict fast of the Apotactity, page 61. But the rules are not always quite clear, owing to Etheria's use of Misa, dismissal, for other services than the Eucharist, as the length of the fast depends on the hour of communion. She speaks also of the fast after Pentecost, page 89, which as late as the 10th century was still, in theory, to be observed in Western Christendom. C. Dowden, Church, Year, and Calendar, page 85 following. We find references to it in St. Athanasius, Apologia de Fuga, 6, and in the Apostolic Constitutions, volume 20. It is perhaps more than a coincidence that one of the ember seasons in the West was fixed by the date of Pentecost. No relaxation was allowed on account of a martyr's festival falling on a station day in Lent at Jerusalem, C.F. Council of Laodicea in Phrygia, A.D. 361, Chapter 51. 8. The Eucharist. The usual liturgical hour on Saturdays and Sundays was the third, 9 a.m., but on station days throughout the year, the ninth, 3 p.m. Once a year on Monday, Thursday, see above, it was even later, i.e. after the tenth hour, 4 p.m. This last usage is stated by Archbishop Bernard, opposite page 61, to have been after a meal in conformity with that of the African Church, Council of Carthage, A.D. 397, chapter 29, and St. Augustine, Epistle ad Januar, chapter 7. But Etheria seems to me very distinctly to state that they took their food after, not before, page 71. Otherwise, during Lent, the liturgy was celebrated only on Saturdays and Sundays, and not on Wednesdays and Fridays. It is interesting to note that the language employed in service time was Greek, not Syriac, though interpretations of lessons and instructions were given in Syriac for the benefit of those who did not know Greek, page 94. At the Sunday Eucharist, as many of the priests who were present preached as wished to, and the bishop preached last of all. The posture of the preacher seems to have been that of sitting, as in the Jewish synagogue, while the congregation stood. Applause, as well as other signs of emotion, were often called forth by the reader or speaker. Page 94. 9. The use of incense is mentioned on page 49, but apparently for fumigation before the liturgy, or at all events the Anapokai itself, begins not actually as part of the ceremonial. 10. Etheria was struck by the use of the Kyrie Leison as a response by the numerous choir boys standing by during the recitation of the names from the diptychs at Vespers, page 47. The evidence goes to show that this formula was not introduced into the west of Christendom till the end of the 5th century. The third canon of the Council of Eson, 529, speaks of it as having reached Provence by way of Rome and Milan, Probably it reached Spain somewhat later. 
c e bishop liturgical history page one one six and following eleven holy baptism the course of preparation of those catechumens who became competentes during lent and the baptism itself on easter eve is fully described and likewise the further instructions given to the newly baptized during the ensuing eastertide the descriptions tally in most respects with what may be gathered from st cyril of jerusalem's eighteen catechetical lectures delivered to the competentes and the five on the mysteries delivered to the neophytes in three eighty six twelve the dedication festival see page forty six below thirteen martyr memorials that of st thomas at edessa is mentioned on page thirty two that of st elpidius at haran on page thirty seven of st thecla at seleucia in isoria on page forty two of st euphemia at chalcedon on page forty three and of st john at ephesus on page forty four among the other churches and holy sites etheria visited besides those in the sinai district mention may be made of the church of melchizedek page twenty eight the garden of st john baptist at anon page twenty seven and the grave of job at carneas page twenty nine she gives a full description on page twenty of the scheme of devotions she and her companions used on each occasion the order followed being thus prayer reading psalm prayer for less full accounts see page seven following twenty one following twenty six following thirty two thirty five following forty and forty three fourteen officers of the church except marthana the deaconess page forty two who had been at jerusalem and was afterwards in charge of nuns at seleucia the only one who needs to be specified here is the archdeacon he is four times mentioned at jerusalem as lifting his voice to announce the place of the next service and to invite the congregation to attend pages sixty three sixty five seventy and eighty seven the same official is mentioned as assisting the bishop when he confers minor orders in the statuta ecclesia antiqua these used to be considered as emanating from the fourth council of carthage three ninety eight but they are now usually assigned to the end of the fifth century and held to be of gallican origin duquesne opsit page one thirty two in any case this is probably the earliest reference to the archdeacon in the east he takes a prominent part in the services of the coptic and syrian churches and is ordained to his office with special rites see denzinger rutus orientalium two page ten seventy eighty six and one forty two fifteen eulogiae at various places etheria was presented with these after service e g at sinai page five where she explains them to be gifts of the fruits grown on the mountain and at nebo on page twenty one and out of the garden or orchard of st john the baptist on page twenty eight see explanation and footnotes in loco of this which can hardly be considered a liturgical matter in the form in which etheria mentions it the churches in jerusalem and the neighborhood in the holy city itself etheria mentions or refers to these church buildings one the old cathedral church on mount zion which in her day was no longer regularly used for service the congregation however went there her expression is proceditur or itur on wednesdays and fridays in lent on easter day and its octave and on whit sunday two the anastasis resurrection on the traditional site of the holy sepulchre three the sanctuary of the cross on the traditional site of golgotha where the wood of the true cross etc were kept this consisted of two parts a ante crucem an open court atrium locus subdivanus with cloisters and b post crucem a smaller roofed-in building for the martyrium ecclesia maior which was also post crucem but exactly where in relation to three b is not quite clear see conjectural plan on page one thirty seven of bernard's edition the great doors valve maiores of it opened on to the market-place de quintana parte 
These last three buildings were set up by the Emperor Constantine in 337, the same year in which the Church of the Apostles, mentioned by Etheria, page 44, had been completed by him in Constantinople. He also built the baptistry near the Anastasis referred to on page 79. The bishop's house, page 50, was probably close by this group of buildings, no longer on Mount Zion. The eight-day dedication festival of the Anastasis and the Martyrium was held in September in close connection with the discovery of the cross and its exaltation at the same time of the year and on the analogy of the dedication of Solomon's temple at the autumn feast of tabernacles. A very large concourse assembled in Jerusalem on this occasion, not only of monks from Mesopotamia, Syria, and Egypt, especially the Thebaid, but also of bishops and clergy and the faithful laity, and the churches were decked out as at Easter and Epiphany. See pages 95 following. In the environs of Jerusalem, she mentions, one, the church at Bethlehem, built and adorned by Constantine, with the help of his mother Helena, page 54. This was the appointed place for the night of the Epiphany and for the Ascension Festival. Two, the church Eleona on the Mount of Olives, where was the cave in which our Lord used to teach his disciples. 3. The Embomon, the traditional site of the Ascension, which was higher up on the mount. It seems to have been rather an enclosed site with seats than a regular church. See page 66. 4. The Graceful Church in Gethsemane, which was no doubt lower down than Eleona. Page 71. 5. The Church on the Road to Bethany, where Mary, Lazarus' sister, met our Lord. Page 63. 6 the Lazarium in Bethany itself. No particulars are to hand of these buildings that the present writer is aware of. End of Section 4 Section 5 of The Pilgrimage of Etheria by Etheria. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Text. The Approach to Sinai. Dot, 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 dot were pointed out according to the scriptures. In the meanwhile, we came on foot to a certain place where the mountains through which we were journeying opened out and formed an infinitely great valley, quite flat and extraordinarily beautiful, and across the valley appeared Sinai, the holy mountain of God. And this place where the mountains opened out lies next to the place where are the graves of lust. Now, on reaching that spot, the holy guides who were with us told us, saying, The custom is that prayer should be made by those who arrive here, when from this place the mount of God is first seen. And this we did. The whole distance from that place to the mount of God was about four miles across the aforesaid great valley. For that valley is indeed very great, lying under the slope of the mount of God, and measuring, as far as we could judge by our sight, or, as they told us, about sixteen miles in length, but they called its breadth four miles. We had, therefore, to cross that valley in order to reach the mountain. Now this is the great and flat valley wherein the children of Israel waited during those days when holy Moses went up into the mount of the Lord, and remained there forty days and forty nights. This, moreover, is the valley in which the calf was made, and the spot is shown to this day, for a great stone stands fixed there on the very site. This also is the same valley at the head of which is the place where, while holy Moses was feeding his father-in-law's flocks, God spake to him twice out of the burning bush. And as our route was first to ascend the mount of God, which is in sight here, because the ascent was easier by the way we were coming, and then to descend to the head of the valley where the bush was, that being the easier descent, so we determined, having first seen all that we desired, to descend from the mount of God so as to arrive at the place of the bush, and thence to return on our journey throughout the whole length of the valley, together with the men of God, who there showed us each place which is mentioned in the scriptures, and so it was done. Thus, going from that spot where we had prayed when we arrived from Pharaon, our route was to cross the middle of the head of that valley, and so turn to the Mount of God. 
Now, the whole mountain group looks as if it were a single peak, but as you enter the group, you see that there are more than one. The whole group, however, is called the Mount of God. But that special peak, which is crowned by the place where, as it is written, the glory of God descended, is in the center of them all. And though all the peaks in the group attain such a height as I think I never saw before, yet the central one, on which the glory of God came down, is so much higher than them all, that when we had ascended it, all those mountains which we had thought to be high were so much beneath us as if they were quite little hills. This is certainly very wonderful, and not, I think, without the favor of God, that while the central height, which is especially called Sinai, on which the glory of the Lord descended, is higher than all the rest, yet it cannot be seen until you reach its very foot, though before you go up it. But after that you have fulfilled your desire and descend, you can see it from the other side, which you cannot do before you begin to ascend. This I had learned from information given by the brethren before we had arrived at the Mount of God, and after I arrived I saw that it was manifestly so." THE ASCENT OF SINAI We reached the mountain, laid on the Sabbath, and arrived at a certain monastery. The monks who dwelt there received us very kindly, showing us every kindness. There is also a church and a priest there. We stayed there that night, and early on the Lord's Day, together with the priest and the monks who dwelt there, we began the ascent of the mountains one by one. These mountains are ascended with infinite toil, for you cannot go up gently by a spiral track, as we say snail shell wise, but you climb straight up the whole way, as if up a wall, and you must come straight down each mountain until you reach the very foot of the middle one, which is specially called Sinai. By this way, then, at the bidding of Christ our God, and helped by the prayers of the holy men who accompanied us, we arrived at the fourth hour, at the summit of Sinai, the holy mountain of God, where the law was given, that is, at the place where the glory of the Lord descended on the day when the mountain smoked. Thus the toil was great, for I had to go up on foot, the ascent being impossible in the saddle, and yet I did not feel the toil on the side of the ascent, I say. I did not feel the toil because I realized that the desire which I had was being fulfilled at God's bidding. In that place there is now a church, not great in size, for the place itself, that is, the summit of the mountain, is not very great. Nevertheless, the church itself is great in grace. When, therefore, at God's bidding, we had arrived at the summit and had reached the door of the church, lo, the priest who was appointed to the church came from his cell and met us, a hale old man, a monk from early life, and an ascetic, as they say here, in short, one worthy to be in that place. The other priests also met us, together with all the monks who dwelt on the mountain, that is, such as were not hindered by age or infirmity. No one, however, dwells on the very summit of the central mountain. There is nothing there excepting only the church and the cave where holy Moses was. When the whole passage from the book of Moses had been read in that place, and when the oblation had been duly made, at which we communicated, and as we were coming out of the church, the priests of the place gave us eulogiae, that is, of fruits which grow on the mountain. For although the holy mountain Sinai is rocky throughout, so that it has not even a shrub on it, yet down below, near the foot of the mountain, around either the central height or those which encircle it, there is a little plot of ground where the holy monks diligently plant little trees and orchards, and set up oratories with cells near to them, so that they may gather fruits which they have evidently cultivated with their own hands from the soil of the very mountain itself. So after we had communicated, and the holy men had given us eulogiae, and we had come out of the door of the church, I began to ask them to show us the several sites. Thereupon the holy men immediately deigned to show us the various places. They showed us the cave where holy Moses was, when he had gone up again into the mount of God, that he might receive the second tables after he had broken the former ones when the people sinned. They also deigned to show us the other sites which we desired to see, and those which they themselves well knew.
But I would have you to know, ladies, reverend sisters, that from the place where we were standing, round outside the walls of the church, that is, from the summit of the central mountain, those mountains, which we could scarcely climb at first, seemed to be so much below us when compared with the central one on which we were standing, that they appeared to be little hills, although they were so very great that I thought that I had never seen higher, except that this central one excelled them by far far. From thence we saw Egypt, and Palestine, and the Red Sea, and the Parthenian Sea, which leads to Alexandria, and the boundless territories of the Saracens, all so much below us as to be scarcely credible, but the holy men pointed out each one of them to us. Oreb Having then fulfilled all the desire with which we had hastened to ascend, we began our descent from the summit of the Mount of God, which we had ascended to another mountain, joined to it, which is called Oreb, where there is a church. This is that Oreb, where was holy Elijah the prophet, when he fled from the face of Ahab the king, and where God spake to him, and said, What dost thou hear, Elijah? As it is written in the books of the kings." The cave where holy Elijah lay hid is shown to this day before the door of the church which is there. A stone altar also is shown which holy Elijah raised to make an offering to God. Thus the holy men deigned to show us each place. There, too, we made the oblation with very earnest prayer, and also read the passage from the Book of the Kings, for it was our special custom that when we had arrived at those places which I had desired to visit, the appropriate passage from the book should always be read. The oblation having been made there, we came to another place not far off, which the priests and monks pointed out to us, where holy Aaron had stood with the seventy elders, when holy Moses was receiving the law from the Lord for the children of Israel. In that place, although it is not covered in, there is a great rock which has a flat surface, rounded in shape, on which those holy men are said to have stood. There is also in the midst of it a kind of altar made of stones. The passage from the book of Moses was read there, and one psalm suitable to the place. Then, after prayer had been made, we descended thence. THE BUSH And now it began to be about the eighth hour, and there were still three miles left before we could get out of the mountains, which we had entered late on the previous day. We had not, however, to go out on the same side by which we had entered, as I said above, because it was necessary that we should walk past and see all the holy places and the cells that were there, and thus come out at the head of the valley, as I said above, that is, of the valley that lies under the mount of God. It was necessary for us to come out at the head of the valley, because there were very many cells of holy men there, and a church in the place where the bush is, which same bush is alive to this day, and throws out shoots. So, having made the whole descent of the mount of God, we arrived at the bush about the tenth hour. This is that bush which I mentioned above, out of which the Lord spake in the fire to Moses, and the same is situated at that spot at the head of the valley, where there are many cells and a church. There is a very pleasant garden in front of the church, containing excellent and abundant water, and the bush itself is in this garden. The spot is also shown hard by where holy Moses stood when God said to him, Loose the latchet of thy shoe, and the rest. Now it was about the tenth hour when we had arrived at the place, and so, as it was late, we could not make the oblation, but prayer was made in the church, and also at the bush in the garden, and the passage from the book of Moses was read according to custom. Then, as it was late, we took a meal with the holy men at a place in the garden before the bush. We stayed there also, and next day, rising very early, we asked the priests that the oblation should be made there, which was done. The sights in the valley and the return to Faran. And as our route lay through the middle and along the length of the valley, the same valley as I said above, where the children of Israel sojourned while Moses ascended into the mount of God and descended thence, so the holy men showed us each place that we came to in the whole valley. 
At the top of the head of the valley where we had stayed, and had seen the bush out of which God spake in the fire to Holy Moses, we had seen also the spot in which Holy Moses had stood before the bush, when God said to him, Loose the latchet of thy shoe, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. In like manner they began to show us the other sights when we set out from the bush. They showed us the place where the camps of the children of Israel were in those days, when Moses was in the mount. They also showed us the place where the calf was made, for a great stone is there to this day, fixed on the very spot. Then, too, as we were going on the other side, we saw the top of the mountain, which overlooks the whole valley, from which place holy Moses saw the children of Israel engaged in dancing at the time when they had made the calf. They showed us a great rock in the place where holy Moses, as he was descending with Joshua the son of Nun, in his anger brake the tables that he was carrying on the same rock. They showed us where they all had their dwelling places in the valley, the foundations of which dwelling places appear to this day, round in form and made with stone. They showed us also the place where holy Moses, when he returned from the mount, bade the children of Israel run from gate to gate. They showed us also the place where the calf which Aaron had made for them was burnt at holy Moses' bidding. They showed us also the stream of which holy Moses made the children of Israel drink, as it is written in Exodus. They showed us also the place where the seventy men received of the Spirit that was upon Moses. They showed us also the place where the children of Israel lusted for meat. They showed us also the place which is called a burning, because part of the camp was consumed what time holy Moses prayed, and the fire ceased. They showed us also the place where it rained manna and quails upon them. Thus were shown to us the sites of all the events which in the sacred books of Moses are recorded to have occurred there, viz. in the valley, which, as I have said, lies under the mount of God, holy Sinai. Now, it would be too much to write of all these things one by one, for so great a number could not be remembered. But when your affection shall read the holy books of Moses, it will more quickly recognize the things that were done in that place. Moreover, this is the valley where the Passover was celebrated, when one year had been fulfilled after that the children of Israel were come out of the land of Egypt. For the children of Israel abode in that valley for some time, that is, while holy Moses ascended into and descended from the Mount of God, the first and the second time. They tarried there also while the tabernacle was being made, together with all things that were shown to Moses in the Mount of God. The place also was shown to us where the tabernacle was set up by Moses for the first time, and all things were finished which God had bidden Moses in the Mount that they should be made. At the very end of the valley we saw the graves of lust at the place where we resumed our route, that is, where leaving the great valley we re-entered the place by which we had come, between the mountains of which I spoke above. On the same day we came up with the other very holy monks who through age or infirmity were unable to meet us in the mount of God for the making of the oblation, who yet deigned to receive us very kindly when we reached their cells. So now that, together with the holy men who dwelt there, we had seen all the holy places we desired, as well as all the places which the children of Israel had touched in going to and from the mount of God, we returned to Pharaoh in the name of God. And although I ought always to give thanks to God in all things, not to speak of these so great favors which he has deigned to confer on me, unworthy as I am, that I should journey through all these places, although I deserved it not, yet I cannot sufficiently thank even all those holy men who deigned with willing mind to receive my littleness in their cells and to guide me surely through all the places which I was always seeking according to the holy scriptures. Moreover, many of these holy men who dwelt on or around the mount of God deigned to escort us back to Pharaoh, but these were of greater bodily strength. End of section 5 Section 6 of The Pilgrimage of Etheria by Etheria. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Faron to Clisma. 
Now, when we had arrived at Faron, which is thirty-five miles distant from the Mount of God, we were obliged to stay there for two days to rest ourselves. On the third day, hastening thence, we came to a station in the desert of Faron, where we had stayed on our outward journey, as I said above. On the next day we came to water, and travelling for a little while among the mountains, we arrived at a station which was on the sea, at the place where the route leaves the mountains and begins to run continuously by the sea. It runs by the sea in such a manner that at one time the waves touch the feet of the animals, while at another the course is through the desert, a hundred, two hundred, and sometimes even more than five hundred paces from the sea, for there is no sort of a road there, the whole being sand sandy desert. The inhabitants of Faran, who are accustomed to travel there with their camels, put signs in different places, and make for these signs when they travel in the daytime, but the camels mark the signs at night. In short, the inhabitants of Faran travel more quickly and safely by night in that place, being accustomed thereto, than other men can travel in places where there is a clear road. Thus, on our return journey, we emerged from the mountains at the place where we entered them on our journey out, and so turned towards the sea. So also did the children of Israel return from Sinai, the mount of God, to this place by the way they had come, that is, to the place where we left the mountains and reached the Red Sea. But while we turned back from this spot along the route by which we had made our journey out, the children of Israel marched hence on their own way, as it is written in the books of Holy Moses. So we returned to Clisma by the same route and the same stations by which we had come out, and when we had arrived at Clisma we were obliged to stay there also for rest, because we had travelled hard along the sandy way of the desert." Clisma to the city of Arabia. Now, although I had been acquainted with the land of Goshen ever since I was in Egypt for the first time, yet I visited it again in order that I might see all the places which the children of Israel touched on their journey out from Ramesses, until they reached the Red Sea, at the place which is now called Clisma, from the fort which is there. I desired, therefore, that we should go from Clisma to the land of Goshen, that is, the city called Arabia, which city is in the land of Goshen. The whole territory is called after the city, the land of Arabia, the land of Goshen, although it is part of Egypt. It is much better land than all the rest of Egypt. From Clisma, that is, from the Red Sea, there are four desert stations, but though in the desert, yet there are military quarters at the stations, with soldiers and officers who always escorted us from fort to fort. On that journey, the holy men who were with us, clergy and monks, showed us all the places which I was always seeking in accordance with the scriptures. Some of these were on the left, some on the right of our path, some were far distant from, and some near to, our route. For I hope that your affection will believe me when I say that, as far as I could see, the children of Israel marched in such wise that, as far as they went to the right, so far did they turn back to the left. As far as they went forward, so far did they return backward, journeying thus until they reached the Red Sea. Apollyon was shown to us from the opposite side when we were at Migdal, where there is now a fort with an officer set over soldiers to maintain Roman discipline. These escorted us thence, according to custom, to another fort, and Baal Zephron was shown to us when we were at that place. It is a plain above the Red Sea, along the side of the mountain which I mentioned above, where the children of Israel cried out when they saw the Egyptians coming after them. Etham also was shown to us, which is on the edge of the wilderness, as it is written, also Succoth, which is a slight elevation in the middle of a valley, and by this little hill the children of Israel encamped. This is the place where the law of the Passover was received. The city of Pithom, which the children of Israel built, was shown to us on the same journey at the place where, leaving the lands of the Saracens, we entered the territory of Egypt. The same Pithom is now a fort. 
the city of hero which existed at the time when joseph met his father jacob as he came as it is written in the book of genesis is now a come though a large one a village as we say this village has a church and martyr memorials and many cells of holy monks so that we had to alight to see each of them in accordance with the custom which we had the village is now called hero it is situated at the sixteenth milestone from the land of goshen and it is within the boundaries of egypt moreover it is a very pleasant spot for an arm of the nile flows there then leaving hero we came to the city which is called arabia situated in the land of goshen for it is written concerning it that pharaoh said to joseph in the best of the land of egypt make thy father and brethren to dwell in the land of goshen in the land of arabia rameses rameses is four miles from the city of arabia and in order to arrive at the station of arabia we passed through the midst of rameses the city of rameses is now open country without a single habitation but it is certainly traceable since it was great in circumference and contained many buildings for its ruins appear to this day in great numbers just as they fell there is nothing there now except one great theban stone on which are carved two statues of great size which they say are those of the holy men moses and aaron raised in their honor by the children of israel there is also a sycamore tree which is said to have been planted by the patriarchs it is certainly very old and therefore very small though it still bears fruit and all who have any indisposition go there and pluck off twigs and it benefits them this we learn from information given by the holy bishop of arabia who himself told us the name of the tree in greek dendros alethia or as we say the tree of truth this holy bishop deigned to meet us at rameses he is an elderly man truly pious from the time he became a monk courteous most kind in receiving pilgrims and very learned in the scriptures of god he after deigning to give himself the trouble of meeting us showed us everything there and told us about the aforesaid statues as well as about the sycamore tree this holy bishop also informed us how pharaoh when he saw that the children of israel had escaped him before he set out after them went with all his army into rameses and burnt the whole city which was very great and then set out thence in pursuit of the children of israel epiphany at the city of arabia return to jerusalem now it fell out by a very happy chance that the day on which we came to the station of arabia was the eve of the most blessed day of the epiphany and the vigils were to be kept in the church on the same day wherefore the holy bishop detained us there for some two days a holy man and truly a man of god well known to me from the time when i had been in the Tebad he became a holy bishop after being a monk for he was brought up from a child in a cell for which reason he is so learned in the scriptures and chastened in his whole life as i said above from this place we sent back the soldiers who according to roman discipline had given us the help of their escort as long as we had walked through suspected places now however as the public road which passed by the city of arabia and leads from the tebad to pelusium ran through egypt there was no need to trouble the soldiers further setting out thence we pursued our journey continuously through the land of goshen among vines that yield wine and vines that yield balsam among orchards highly cultivated fields and very pleasant gardens our whole route lying along the bank of the river nile among off recurring estates which were once the homesteads of the children of israel and why should i say more for i think that i have never seen a more beautiful country than the land of goshen and travelling thus for two days from the city of arabia through the land of goshen continuously we arrived at tatnes the city where holy moses was born this city of tatnes was once pharaoh's metropolis 
now although i had already known these places as i said above when i had been at alexandria and in the tabad yet i wished to learn thoroughly all the places through which the children of israel marched on their journey from rameses to sinai the holy mountain of god this made it necessary to return to the land of goshen and thence to tatnis we set out from tatnis and walking along the route that was already known to me i came to pelusium thence i set out again and journeying through all those stations in egypt through which we had travelled before i arrived at the boundary of palestine thence in the name of christ our god i passed through several stations in palestine and returned to aelia that is jerusalem visit to the jordan valley having spent some time there at god's bidding my will was to go as far as arabia to mount nebo where god commanded moses to go up saying to him get thee up into the mountain arabat into mount nebo which is in the land of moab which is over against jericho and behold the land of canaan which i give unto the children of israel for a possession and die in the mount whither thou goest up so jesus our god who will not forsake them that hope in him deigned to give effect to this my wish wherefore setting out from jerusalem and journeying with holy men with a priest and deacons from jerusalem and with certain brothers that is monks we came to that spot on the jordan where the children of israel had crossed when holy joshua the son of nun had led them over jordan as it is written in the book of joshua the son of nun the place where the children of reuben and of gad and the half-tribe of manasseh had made an altar was shown us a little higher up on that side of the river bank where jericho is crossing the river we came to a city called divius which is in the plain where the children of israel encamped at that time for the foundations of the camp of the children of israel and of their dwellings where they abode appear there to this day the plain is a very great one lying under the mountains of arabia above the jordan it is the place of which it is written and the children of israel wept for moses in the arabat moab on the jordan over against jericho forty days this is the place where after moses death joshua the son of nun was straightway filled with the spirit of wisdom for moses had laid his hands upon him as it is written this is the place where moses wrote the book of deuteronomy and where he spake in the ears of all the congregation of israel the words of this song until it was ended it is written in the book of deuteronomy here holy moses the man of god blessed the children of israel one by one in order before his death so when we had arrived at this plain we went to the very spot and prayer was made here too a certain part of deuteronomy was read as well as his song with the blessings which he pronounced over the children of israel after the reading prayer was made a second time and giving thanks to god we moved on thence for it was always customary with us that whenever we succeeded in reaching the places we desired to visit prayer should first be made there then the lection should be read from the book then one appropriate psalm should be said then prayer should be made again at god's bidding we always kept to this custom whenever we were able to come to the places we desired after this that the work begun should be accomplished we began to hasten in order to reach mount nebo as we went the priest of the place i e livius whom we had prayed to accompany us from the station because he knew the place as well advised us saying if you wish to see the water which flows from the rock which moses gave to the children of israel when they were thirsty you can see it if you are willing to undertake the labor of going about six miles out of the way when he had said this we very eagerly wished to go and turning at once out of our way we followed the priest who led us in that place there is a little church under a mountain not nebo but another height behind not yet far from nebo many truly holy monks dwell there whom they call here ascetics these holy monks deigned to receive us very kindly and permitted us to go in to greet them 
When we had entered and prayer had been made with them, they deigned to give us eulogiae, which they are wont to give to those whom they receive kindly. There, in the midst, between the church and the cells, there flows from out of the rock a great stream of water, very beautiful and limpid and excellent to the taste. Then we asked those holy monks who dwelt there, What was this water of so good a flavor? And they said, This is the water which holy Moses gave to the children of Israel in this desert. So prayer was made there according to custom, the lection was read from the books of Moses, and one psalm said, Then, with the holy clergy and monks who had come with us, we went out to the mountain. Many of the holy monks also who dwelt by that water, and who could undertake the labor, deigned to ascend Mount Nebo with us. So setting out thence, we arrived at the foot of Mount Nebo, which was very high. Nevertheless, the greater part could be ascended sitting on asses, though a little bit was steeper and had to be climbed laboriously on foot, which was done. End of Section 6 Section 7 of The Pilgrimage of Etheria by Etheria. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mount Nebo. We arrived then at the summit of the mountain, where there is now a church of no great size, on the very top of Mount Nebo. Inside the church, in the place where the pulpit is, I saw a place a little raised, containing about as much space as tombs usually contain. I asked the holy men what this was, and they answered, Here was holy Moses laid by the angels, for, as it is written, no man knoweth of his burial, since it is certain that he was buried by the angels. His tomb, indeed, where he was laid, is not shown to this day, for, as it was shown to us by our ancestors who dwelt here where he was laid, so do we show it to you, and our ancestors said that this tradition was handed down to them by their own ancestors. So prayer was made anon, and all things that we were accustomed to do in their order in every place were done here also, and we began to go out of the church. Then they who knew the place, the priests and the holy monks, said to us, If you wish to see the places that are mentioned in the books of Moses, come out of the door of the church, and from the very summit, from the side on which they are visible from here, look and see, and we will tell you each place that is visible from thence. Then we rejoiced greatly, and immediately came out. From the door of the church we saw the place where the Jordan runs into the Dead Sea, which place appeared below us as we stood. On the opposite side we saw not only Livias, which was on the near side of Jordan, but also Jericho, which was beyond Jordan. To so great a height rose the lofty place where we stood before the door of the church. The greatest part of Palestine, the land of promise, was in sight, together with the whole land of Jordan, as far as it could be seen with our eyes. On the left side we saw all the lands of the Sodomites and Segor, which is the only one of the five cities that exists today. There is a memorial of it, but nothing appears of those other cities but a heap of ruins, just as they were turned into ashes. The place where was the inscription concerning Lot's wife was shown to us, which place is read of in the scriptures. But believe me, reverend ladies, the pillar itself cannot be seen, only the place is shown. The pillar is said to have been covered by the Dead Sea. Certainly, when we saw the place, we saw no pillar. I cannot, therefore, deceive you in this. The bishop of the place, that is, of Sigor, told us that it is now some years since the pillar could be seen. The spot where the pillar stood is about six miles from Sigor, and the water now covers the whole of this space. Then we went to the right side of the church, out of doors, and opposite to us, two cities were pointed out. The one is Sibon, now called Exibon, which belonged to Sion, king of the Amorites, and the other, now called Sazdra, the city of Og, the king of Basan. Fogor, which was a city of the kingdom of Edom, was also pointed out from thence, opposite to us. 
All these cities which we saw were situated on mountains, but a little below them the ground seemed to be flatter. Then we were told that in the days when Holy Moses and the children of Israel had fought against those cities, they had encamped there, and indeed the signs of a camp were visible there. From the side of the mountain, which I have called the left, which was over the Dead Sea, a very sharp-cut mountain was shown to us, which was formerly called Agri Specula. This is the mountain on which Balak, the son of Beor, placed Balaam, the soothsayer, to curse the children of Israel, and God refused to permit it, as it is written. Then, having seen everything that we desired, we returned in the name of God through Jericho back to Jerusalem along the whole of the route by which we had come. Visit to Alsatis now, after some time, I wished to go to the region of Ausitas to visit the tomb of Holy Job, for the sake of prayer. For I used to see many holy monks coming thence to Jerusalem to visit the holy places for the sake of prayer, who, giving information of everything concerning those places, increased my desire to undertake the toil of going to them also, if indeed that can be called toil, by which a man sees his desire to be fulfilled. So I set out from Jerusalem with the holy men who deigned to give me their company on my journey, they themselves also going for the sake of prayer, making my journey from Jerusalem through eight stations to Carneas. The city of Job is now called Carneas, but it was formerly called Denaba in the land of Ausitas on the confines of Idumea and Arabia. Traveling on this journey, I saw on the bank of the river Jordan a very beautiful and pleasant valley abounding in vines and trees, for such excellent water was there, and in that valley there was a large village, which is now called Sedima. The village, which is situated in the middle of the level ground, has in its midst a little hill of no great size, shaped as large tombs are wont to be. There is a church on the summit, and down below, around the little hill, great and ancient foundations appear, while in the village itself some grave mounds still remain. When I saw this pleasant place, I asked what it was, and it was told me, This is the city of King Melchizedek, which was called Salem, but now, through the corruption of the language, the village is called Sedima. On the top of the little hill, which is situated in the midst of the village, the building that you see is a church, which is now called in the Greek language Opu Melchizedek. For this is the place where Melchizedek offered pure sacrifices, that is, bread and wine, to God, as it is written of him. The City of Melchizedek Directly I heard this, we alighted from our beasts, and, lo, the holy priest of the place and the clergy deigned to meet us, and straightway, receiving us, led us up to the church. When we had arrived there, prayer was first said according to custom, then the passage from the book of Holy Moses was read, then one psalm suitable to the place was said, then, after prayer made, we came down. When we had come down, the holy priest addressed us. He was an elderly man, well taught in the scriptures, and he had presided over the place from the time he had been a monk, to whose life many bishops, as we learned afterwards, bore great testimony, saying that he was worthy to preside over the place where holy Melchizedek, when Abraham was coming to meet him, was the first to offer pure sacrifices to God. When we had come down from the church, as I said above, the holy priest said to us, Behold, these foundations which you see around the little hill are those of the palace of King Melchizedek. For from his time to the present day, if any one wishes to build himself a house here, and so strikes on these foundations, he sometimes finds little fragments of silver and bronze. And this way which you see passing between the river Jordan and this village is the way by which holy Abraham returned to Sodom after the slaughter of Cheddar Laramar, king of nations, and where holy Melchizedek, the king of Salem, met him. Enon. Then, because I remembered that it was written that St. John had baptized an Enon near to Salem, I asked him how far off that place was. It is near, two hundred paces off, and if you wish, I will now lead you there on foot. This large and pure stream of water, which you see in this village, comes from that spring. 
Then I began to thank him and to ask him to lead us to the place, which was done. So we began to go with him on foot through the very pleasant valley until we reached a most pleasant orchard, in the midst of which he showed us a spring of excellent and pure water, which sent out continuously a good stream. The spring had in front of it a sort of pool, where it appears that St. John the Baptist fulfilled his ministry. Then the holy priest said to us, this garden is called nothing else to this day than Sippos to Agui Ioannu in the Greek language, or, as you say in Latin, or to Sancti Ioannis. Many brethren, holy monks, direct their steps hither from various places that they may wash here. So at the spring, as in every place, prayer was made, the proper lection was read, and an appropriate psalm was said and everything that it was customary for us to do whenever we came to the holy places we did there also the holy priest also told us that to this day at easter all they who are to be baptized in the village that is in the church which is called opus melchizedek are always baptized in this spring returning early to vespers with the clergy and monks saying psalms and antiphons so that they who have been baptized are led back early from the fountain to the church of holy melchizedek then receiving eulogiae out of the orchard of st john the baptist from the priest as well as from the holy monks who had cells in the same orchard and always giving thanks to god we set out on the way we were going the city of elijah the brook cherith then going for a time through the valley of the jordan on the bank of the river because our route lay that way for a while we suddenly saw the city of the holy prophet elijah that is thesbe whence he had the name of elijah the tishbite there to this day is the cave wherein the holy man sat there too is the tomb of holy getha whose name we read in the books of the judges there too we gave thanks to god according to custom and pursued our journey and as we journeyed that way we saw a very pleasant valley opening towards us on the left it was very large and discharged a very great torrent into the jordan and in that valley we saw the cell of one who is now a brother that is a monk then i as i am very inquisitive began to ask what was this valley where the holy monk had now made himself a cell for i did not think it was without reason then the holy men who were journeying with us and who knew the place said this is the valley of korah where holy elijah the tishbite dwelt in the time of king ahab when there was a famine and at the bidding of god the raven used to bring him food and he drank water of the torrent for this brook which you see running through this valley into Jordan is Korah. Wherefore, giving thanks to God, who deigned to show us everything that we desired, unworthy as we were, we began to make our journey as on other days. And as we journeyed day by day, on the left side, whence on the opposite side we saw parts of Phoenicia, there suddenly appeared a great and high mountain, which extended in length, dot, dot 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 a leaf is torn out burial place of job return to jerusalem dot 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 which holy monk and ascetic after so many years spent in the desert found it necessary to move and to go down to the city of carneas in order to advise the bishop and clergy of that time according as it had been revealed to him that they should dig in that place which had been shown to him which was done and they, digging in that place which had been shown to him, found a cave, which they followed for about a hundred paces, when suddenly, as they dug, a stone tomb came to light, and when they had uncovered it, they found, carved on its lid, the name Job. To this Job the church which you see has been built in that place, in such a manner that the stone with the body should not be moved, but that it should be placed where the body had been found, and that the body should lie under the altar. That church, which was built by some tribune, has been unfinished to this day." next morning we asked the bishop to make the oblation which he deigned to do and the bishop blessing us we set out 
there too we communicated and always giving thanks to god we returned to jerusalem journeying through each of the stations through which we had passed three years before journey into mesopotamia having spent some time there in the name of god when three full years had passed since i came to jerusalem and having seen all the holy places which i had visited for the sake of prayer my mind was to return to my country i wished however at god's bidding to go to mesopotamia in syria to visit the holy monks who were there in great number and who were said to be of such holy life as could hardly be described and also for the sake of prayer at the memorial of st thomas the apostle where his body is laid entire this is at edessa for jesus our god by a letter which he sent to abgar the king by the hand of ananias the courier promised that he would send st thomas thither after that he himself had ascended into heaven the letter is kept with great reverence at the city of edessa where the memorial is now your affection may believe me that there is no christian who having arrived at the holy places that are at jerusalem does not go on thither for the sake of prayer it is at the twenty-fifth station from jerusalem and since from antioch it is nearer to mesopotamia it was very convenient for me at god's bidding that as i was returning to constantinople and my way lying through antioch i should go thence to mesopotamia this, then, at God's bidding, I did. End of section 7 Section 8 of The Pilgrimage of Etheria by Etheria This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Antioch to Mesopotamia, the crossing of the Euphrates. Then, setting out from Antioch to Mesopotamia in the name of Christ our God, I journeyed through certain stations and cities of the province of Sile, Syria, which is Antioch, and entering the borders of the province of Augusta Fratensis, I came to the city of Gerapolis, which is the metropolis of Augusto Fratensis. And as this city is very beautiful and rich and abounds in everything, it was necessary for me to make a halt there, for the borders of Mesopotamia were not far distant. Then, starting from Hierapolis, I came in the name of God at the fifteenth milestone to the river Euphrates, of which it is very well written that it is the great river Euphrates. It is huge, and as it were, terrible, for it flows down with a current like the river Rhone, only the Euphrates is still greater. And as we had to cross in ships, and in large ships only, I waited there until after midday, and then in the name of God I crossed the river Euphrates and entered the borders of Mesopotamia in Syria. Edessa then journeying through certain stations i came to a city whose name we read recorded in the scriptures batanis which city exists to-day it has a church with a truly holy bishop both monk and confessor and certain martyr memorials the city has a teeming population and the soldiery with their tribune are stationed there departing thence we arrived at edessa in the name of christ our god and on our arrival we straightway repaired to the church and memorial of st thomas there according to custom prayers were made and the other things that were customary in the holy places were done we read also some things concerning st thomas himself the church there is very great very beautiful and of new construction well worthy to be the house of god and as there was much that i desired to see it was necessary for me to make a three days stay there thus i saw in that city many memorials together with holy monks some dwelling at the memorials while others had their cells in more secluded spots farther from the city moreover the holy bishop of the city a truly devout man both monk and confessor received me willingly and said as i see daughter that for the sake of devotion you have undertaken so great a labor in coming to these places from far distant lands if you are willing we will show you all the places that are pleasant to the sight of christians then first thanking god i besought the bishop much that he would deign to do as he said 
he thereupon led me first to the palace of king abgar where he showed me a great marble statue of him very much like him as they said having a sheen as if made of pearl from the face of abgar it seemed that he was a very wise and honourable man then the holy bishop said to me behold king abgar who before he saw the lord believed in him that he was in truth the son of god there was another statue near made of the same marble which he said was that of his son magnus this also had something gracious in the face then we entered the inner part of the palace and there were fountains full of fish such as i never saw before of so great size so bright and of so good a flavour were they the city has no water at all other than that which comes out of the palace which is like a great silver river the story of king abgarus then the holy bishop told me about the water saying at some time after that king abgar had written to the lord and the lord had answered king abgar by ananias the courier as it is written in the letter itself when some time had passed the persians came against the city and surrounded it and straightway abgar bearing the letter of the lord to the gate with all of his army prayed publicly and he said o lord jesus thou hast promised us that none of our enemies should enter this city and and lo the persians now attack us and when the king had said this holding the open letter in his uplifted hands suddenly there came a great darkness outside the city before the eyes of the persians as they were approaching the city at a distance of about three miles and they were so baffled by the darkness that they could hardly form their camp and surround the whole city about three miles off so baffled were the persians that they could never afterwards see the way to enter the city but they surrounded it and shut it in with their hostile forces at a distance of about three miles for several months then when they saw that they could by no means enter they wished to slay those within the city by thirst now that little hill which you see my daughter over against the city supplied it with water at that time and the persians perceiving this diverted the water from the city and made it to run near that place where they had made their camp and on that day and at that hour when the persians diverted the water the fountains which you see in this place burst forth at once at god's bidding and by the favour of god they remain here from that day to this but the water which the persians had diverted was dried up at that hour so that they who were besieging the city had nothing to drink for even one day which thing is plain to the present time for no moisture of any sort has ever been seen there from that day to this so at god's bidding who had promised that this should come to pass they were obliged to return to their own home in persia moreover afterwards as often as enemies determined to come and take the city this letter was brought out and read in the gate and straightway all enemies were driven back by the will of god the holy bishop also told me that the place where these fountains broke forth had previously been open ground within the city lying under the palace of king abgar which same palace had been situated on somewhat higher ground as was plainly visible for the custom was at that time that whenever palaces were built they should always stand on higher ground but after that these fountains had burst forth here then apgar built this palace for his son magnus whose statue i saw near that of his father so that the fountain should be included in the palace and when the holy bishop had told me all these things he said to me let us now go to the gate by which ananias the courier entered with the letter of which i spoke so when we had come to the gate the bishop standing made a prayer and read us the letters then after he had blessed us another prayer was made moreover the holy man told us that from the day on which ananias the courier entered it with the letter of the lord the gate is kept to this day that no one who is unclean nor any mourner should pass through nor should any dead body be borne out through it 
the holy bishop also showed us the memorial of abgar and of his whole family very beautiful but made in the ancient style he took us also to the palace which king abgar had at first on the higher ground and if there were any other places he showed them to us it was very pleasant to me to receive from the holy man himself the letters of abgar to the lord and of the lord to abgar which the holy bishop had read to us there for although i have copies at home yet it seemed to me more pleasant to receive them from him lest perhaps something less might have reached us at home and indeed that which i received here is fuller so if jesus our god bids it and i come home you too shall read them ladies my own souls Sharay, haran then after three days spent there it was necessary for me to go still farther to Sharay, as it is now called in holy scripture it is called sharon where holy abraham dwelt as it is written in genesis when the lord said unto abram get thee out of thy country and from thy father's house and go to sharon and the rest and when i arrived at Shere, i went straightway to the church which is within the city and soon i saw the bishop of the place a truly holy man of god both monk and confessor who deigned to show us all the places there that we desired he took us at once to the church which is without the city on the spot where stood the house of holy abraham it stands on the same foundations and it is made of the same stone as the holy bishop said when we had come to the church prayer was made the passage from genesis was read one psalm was said and after a second prayer the bishop blessed us and we came out then he deigned to take us to the well whence the holy rebecca used to fetch the water and the holy bishop said to us behold the well whence holy rebecca watered the camels of holy abraham's servant eleazar thus he deigned to show us each thing now at the church which is outside the city as i said ladies reverend sisters where abraham's house was originally there is now the martyr memorial of a certain holy monk named helpidius it happened very pleasantly for us that we arrived on the day before the martyr's feast of st helpidius which is on the twenty-third of april on that day it was of obligation that all the monks from all parts and from all the borders of mesopotamia should come down to Sharay, even the greater ones who dwelt in solitude whom they call ascetics for this day is observed with great dignity there on account of the memorial of holy abraham whose house stood where the church now is in which the body of the holy martyr is laid so it happened to us very pleasantly beyond our expectations that we should see these holy monks of mesopotamia truly men of god as well as those whose good report and manner of life had reached men's ears far and wide whom i thought that i could not by any means see not because it was impossible for god to give me this who had deigned to give me all things but because i had heard that they never came down from their dwellings except on easter day and on this day for they are men who do many wonders and moreover i did not know in what month was the day of the martyrs feast which i have mentioned but at god's bidding it came about that i arrived on the day that i had not hoped for we stayed there two days for the memorial day and for the sake of seeing these holy men who deigned to receive me very willingly for the sake of salutation and to speak with me of which i was not worthy nor were they seen there after the memorial day for they sought the desert without delay in the night each one returning to his own cell in that city i found scarcely a single christian excepting a few clergy and holy monks if any such dwell in the city all are heathen and in like manner as we gazed with great reverence at the place where the house of holy abraham was at first for the sake of his memorial so do those heathen gaze with great reverence at a place about a mile from the city where are the memorials of nahor and bethuel and since the bishop of that city is very learned in the scriptures i asked him saying i beg of you my lord to tell me that which i desire to hear and he said tell me daughter what you wish and i will tell it you if i know it 
then i said i know by the scriptures that holy abraham came to this place with his father terah and with sarah his wife and with lot his brother's son but i have not read when nahor and bethuel came here i know only that afterwards abraham's servant came to shareh that he might seek Rebekah, the daughter of Bethuel, the son of Nahor, for Isaac, the son of his master Abraham. Then the holy bishop said to me, Truly, daughter, it is written, as you say, in Genesis, that holy Abraham came here with his relatives, but canonical scripture does not say when Nahor and his relatives and Bethuel came here, but it is plain that they did come here afterwards, since their memorials are here at about a mile from the city. The scripture does indeed relate how holy Abraham's servant came here to take holy Rebekah, and how holy Jacob came here when he took to himself the daughters of Laban the Syrian. Then I asked where was the well where holy Jacob watered the flocks which Rachel the daughter of Laban the Syrian was feeding. The bishop said to me, The place is six miles hence, near the village which then was the farm of Laban the Syrian, and if you wish to go there, we will go with you and show it to you. There are also many very holy monks and ascetics and a holy church. I also asked the holy bishop where was that place of the Chaldees where Tira lived at first with his family, and the holy bishop said to me, The place, daughter, of which you ask is at the tenth station hence as you go into Persia. There are five stations from here to Nisibis, and five stations thence to Hur, which was a city of the Chaldees, but there is now no access for Romans, for the Persians hold the whole country. This district is specially called the Eastern. It is on the borders of the Romans, the Persians, and the Chaldees. And many other things he deigned to tell me, as did also the other holy bishops and holy monks. But all they told us was from the scriptures of God, or of the acts of holy men, that is, of monks, either the wonderful things that those already departed had done, or what those who are still in the body do daily, at any rate those who are ascetic for I would not that your affection should think that the monks ever told me any other stories except from the scriptures of God, or else those of the acts of the great monks. Rachel's Well, The Return to Antioch Now, after two days which I spent there, the bishop took us to the well where holy Jacob had watered holy Rachel's flocks. The well is six miles from Cherry, and in its honor a very great and beautiful holy church has been built hard by. When we had come to the well, prayer was made by the bishop, the passage from Genesis was read, one psalm suitable to the place was said, and after a second prayer the bishop blessed us. We saw also, lying on a spot near the well, that very great stone which holy Jacob had moved away from the well, and which is shown today. No one dwells there around the well except the clergy of the church which is there, and the monks who have their cells near at hand, whose truly unheard-of mode of life the bishop described to us. Then, after prayer had been made in the church, I visited, in company with the bishop, the holy monks in their cells, giving thanks both to God and to them, who deigned with willing mind to receive me in their cells wherever I entered, and to address me in such words as were fitting to proceed out of their mouth. They deigned also to give me and all who were with me eulogiae, such as is the custom for monks to give those whom they receive with willing mind into their cells. And the place, being in a large plain, a great village over against us, was pointed out to me by the holy bishop, about five hundred paces from the well, through which village our route lay." This village, as the bishop said, was once the farm of Laban the Syrian, and is called Fadana. In the village, the memorial of Laban the Syrian, Jacob's father-in-law, was shown to me. The place was also shown to me, where Rachel stole her father's images. So having seen everything in the name of God, and bidding farewell to the holy bishop and the holy monks who had deigned to conduct us to the place, we returned by the route and by the stations through which we had come from Antioch. Antioch to Tarsus 
when i had gone back to antioch i stayed there for a week while the things that were necessary for our journey were being prepared then starting from antioch and journeying through several stations i came to the province called cilicia which has tarsus for its metropolis i had already been at tarsus on my way to jerusalem but as the memorial of st thecla is at the third station from tarsus in hisaria it was very pleasant for me to go there especially as it was so very near at hand visit to st thecla's church return to constantinople so setting out from tarsus i came to a certain city on the sea still in cilicia which is called pompeiopolis thence i entered the borders of hisaria and stayed in a city called coricus and on the third day i arrived at a city which is called seleucia in hisaria on my arrival i went to the bishop a truly holy man formerly a monk and in that city i saw a very beautiful church and as the distance thence to st thecla which is situated outside the city on a low eminence was about fifteen hundred paces i chose rather to go there in order to make the stay that i intended there is nothing at the holy church in that place except numberless cells of men and of women i found there a very dear friend of mine to whose manner of life all in the east bore testimony a holy deaconess named marthana whom i had known at jerusalem whither she had come for the sake of prayer she was ruling over the cells of apotactite and virgins and when she had seen me how can i describe the extent of her joy or of mine but to return to the matter at hand there are very many cells on the hill and in the midst of it a great wall which encloses the church containing the very beautiful memorial the wall was built to guard the church because of the hisari who are very malicious and who frequently commit acts of robbery to prevent them from making an attempt on the monastery which is established there when i had arrived in the name of god prayer was made at the memorial and the whole of the acts of st thecla having been read i gave endless thanks to christ our god who deigned to fulfil my desires in all things unworthy and undeserving as i am then after a stay of two days when i had seen the holy monks and apothectity who were there both men and women and when i had prayed and made my communion i returned to tarsus and to my journey from tarsus after a halt of three days i set out on my journey in the name of god and arriving on the same day at a station called mansocrine which is under mount taurus i stayed there on the next day going under mount taurus and travelling by the route that was already known to me through each province that i had traversed on my way out to wit cappadocia galatia and bithynia i arrived at chalcedon where i stayed for the sake of the very famous martyr memorial of st euphemia which was already known to me from a former time on the next day crossing the sea i arrived at constantinople giving thanks to christ our god who deigned to give me such grace unworthing and undeserving as i am for he had deigned to give me not only the will to go but also the power of walking through the places that i desired and of returning at last to constantinople when i had arrived there i went through all the churches that of the apostles and all the martyr memorials of which there are very many and i ceased not to give thanks to jesus our god who had thus deigned to bestow his mercy upon me from which place ladies light of my eyes while i send these letters to your affection i have already purposed in the name of christ our god to go to ephesus in asia for the sake of prayer because of the memorial of the holy and blessed apostle john and if after this i am yet in the body and am able to see any other places i will either tell it to your affection in person if god deigns to permit me this or in otherwise if i have another project in mind i will send you news of it in a letter but do you ladies light of my eyes deign to remember me whether i am in the body or out of the body end of section eight
Section 9 of The Pilgrimage of Etheria by Etheria. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Jerusalem, 1. Daily Offices, 1. Matins. Now that your affection may know what is the order of service, operatio, day by day in the holy places, I must inform you, for I know that you would willingly have this knowledge. Every day before cock-crow all the doors of the Anastasis are opened, and all the monks and virgins, as they call them here, go thither, and not they alone, but lay people also, both men and women, who desire to begin their vigil early. And from that hour to daybreak hymns are said, and psalms are sung responsively, responduteur, and antiphons in like manner and prayer is made after each of the hymns. For priests, deacons, and monks in twos or threes take it in turn every day to say prayers after each of the hymns or antiphons. But when day breaks, they begin to say the matin hymns. Thereupon the bishop arrives with the clergy, and immediately enters into the cave, and from within the rails, canceli, he first says a prayer for all, mentioning the names of those whom he wishes to commemorate he then blesses the catechumens afterwards he says a prayer and blesses the faithful and when the bishop comes out from within the rails every one approaches his hand and he blesses them one by one as he goes out and the dismissal takes place by daylight two sext and known in like manner, at the sixth hour, all go again to the Anastasis, and psalms and antiphons are said, while the bishop is being summoned. Then he comes as before, not taking his seat, but he enters at once within the rails in the Anastasis, that is, in the cave, just as in the early morning. And as then, he again first says a prayer, then he blesses the faithful, and as he comes out from within the rails, every one approaches his hand, and the same is done at the ninth hour as at the sixth. 3. Vespers now at the tenth hour which they call here the kinecon or as we say lucinaria all the people assemble at the anastasis in the same manner and all the candles and tapers are lit making a very great light now the light is not introduced from without but it is brought forth from within the cave that is from within the rails where a lamp is always burning day and night and the vesper psalms and antiphons are said lasting for a considerable time then the bishop is summoned and he comes and takes a raised seat and likewise the priests sit in their proper places and hymns and antiphons are said and when all these have been recited according to custom the bishop rises and stands before the rails that is before the cave and one of the deacons makes the customary commemoration of individuals one by one and as the deacon pronounces each name the many little boys who are always standing by answer with countless voices kyrie eleison or as we say miserere domine and when the deacon has finished all that he has to say first the bishop says a prayer and prays for all then they all pray both the faithful and catechumens together again the deacon raises his voice bidding each catechumen to bow his head where he stands and the bishop stands and says the blessing over the catechumens again prayer is made and again the deacon raises his voice and bids the faithful each where he stands to bow the head and the bishop likewise blesses the faithful thus the dismissal takes place at the anastasis and one by one all draw near to the bishop's hand afterwards the bishop is conducted from the anastasis to the cross with hymns all the people accompanying him and when he arrives he first says a prayer then he blesses the catechumens then another prayer is said and he blesses the faithful thereupon both the bishop and the whole multitude further proceed behind the cross where all that was done before the cross is repeated and they approach the hand of the bishop behind the cross as they did at the anastasis and before the cross moreover there are hanging everywhere a vast number of great glass chandeliers and there are also a vast number of seriophala before the anastasis before the cross 
and behind the cross, for the whole does not end until darkness has set in. This is the order of daily services, operatio, at the cross and at the Anastasis throughout the six days. 2. Sunday Offices 1. Vigil but on the seventh day, that is, on the Lord's day, the whole multitude assembles before cock-crow in as great numbers as the place can hold, as at Easter, in the basilica, which is near the Anastasis, but outside the doors, where lights are hanging for the purpose. And for fear that they should not be there at cock-crow, they come beforehand and sit down there. Hymns as well as antiphons are said, and prayers are made between the several hymns and antiphons, for at the vigils there are always both priests and deacons ready there for the assembling of the multitude, the custom being that the holy places are not opened before cock crow. Now, as soon as the first cock has crowed, the bishop arrives and enters the cave at the Anastasis. All the doors are opened, and the whole multitude enters the Anastasis, where countless lights are already burning. And when the people have entered, one of the priests says a psalm, to which all respond, and afterwards prayer is made. Then one of the deacons says a psalm, and prayer is again made. A third psalm is said by one of the clergy. Prayer is made for the third time, and there is a commemoration of all. After these three psalms and three prayers are ended, lo, censers are brought into the cave of the Anastasis, so that the whole basilica of the Anastasis is filled with odors. And then the bishop, standing within the rails, takes the book of the gospel, and proceeding to the door, himself reads the narrative of the resurrection of the Lord. And when the reading is begun, there is so great a moaning and groaning among all, with so many tears, that the hardest of heart might be moved to tears, for that the Lord had borne such things for us. After the reading of the gospel, the bishop goes out and is accompanied to the cross by all the people with hymns. There again a psalm is said and prayer is made, after which he blesses the faithful and the dismissal takes place, and as he comes out, all approach to his hand. And forthwith the bishop betakes himself to his house, and from that hour all the monks return to the Anastasis, where psalms and antiphons, with prayer after each psalm or antiphon, are said until daylight. The priests and deacons also keep watch in turn daily at the Anastasis with the people, but of the lay people, whether men or women, those who are so minded, remain in the place until daybreak, and those who are not return to their houses and betake themselves to sleep. 2. Morning Services now at daybreak, because it is the Lord's day, every one proceeds to the greater church, built by Constantine, which is situated in Golgotha, behind the cross, where all things are done which are customary everywhere on the Lord's day. But the custom here is that of all the priests who take their seats, as many as are willing, preach, and after them all, the bishop preaches, and these sermons are always on the Lord's day, in order that the people may always be instructed in the scriptures and in the love of God. The delivery of these sermons greatly delays the dismissal from the church, so that the dismissal does not take place before the fourth or perhaps the fifth hour. But when the dismissal from the church is made in the manner that is customary everywhere, the monks accompany the bishop with hymns from the church to the Anastasis. And as he approaches with hymns, all the doors of the Basilica of the Anastasis are opened, and the people, that is the faithful, enter, but not the catechumens. And after the people, the bishop enters, and goes at once within the rails of the cave of the martyrium. Thanks are first given to God, then prayer is made for all, after which the deacon bids all bow their heads where they stand, and the bishop, standing within the inner rails, blesses them and goes out, each one drawing near to his hand as he makes his exit. Thus the dismissal is delayed until nearly the fifth or sixth hour, and in like manner it is done at Lutinaria, according to daily custom. 
this then is the custom observed every day throughout the whole year except on solemn days to the keeping of which we will refer later on but among all things it is a special feature that they arrange that suitable psalms and antiphons are said on every occasion both those said by night or in the morning as well as those throughout the day at the sixth hour the ninth hour or at lucanaria all being so appropriate and so reasonable as to bear on the matter in hand and they proceed to the greater church which was built by constantine and which is situated in golgotha that is behind the cross on every lord's day throughout the year except on the one sunday of pentecost when they proceed to zion as you will find mentioned below but even then they go to zion before the third hour the dismissal having been first made in the greater church dot 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 a leaf is wanting three festivals at epiphany one night station at bethlehem dot 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 blessed is he that cometh in the name of the lord and the rest which follows and since for the sake of the monks who go on foot it is necessary to walk slowly the arrival in jerusalem thus takes place at the hour when one man begins to be able to recognize another that is close upon but a little before daybreak and on arriving there the bishop and all with him immediately enter the anastasis where an exceedingly great number of lights are already burning there a psalm is said prayer is made first the catechumens and then the faithful are blessed by the bishop then the bishop retires and every one returns to his lodging to take rest but the monks remain there until daybreak and recite hymns two morning services at jerusalem but after the people have taken rest at the beginning of the second hour they all assemble in the greater church which is in golgotha now it would be superfluous to describe the adornment either of the church or of the anastasis or of the cross or in bethlehem on that day you see there is nothing but gold and gems and silk for if you look at the veils they are made wholly of silk striped with gold and if you look at the curtains they too are made wholly of silk striped with gold the church vessels too of every kind gold and jeweled are brought out on that day and indeed who could either reckon or describe the number and weight of the seriophala or of the centenarale or of the lucianaire or of the various vessels and what shall i say of the decoration of the fabric itself which constantine at his mother's instigation decorated with gold mosaic and costly marbles as far as the resources of his kingdom allowed him that is the greater church as well as the anastasis at the cross and the other holy places in jerusalem but to return to the matter in hand the dismissal takes place on the first day in the greater church which is in golgotha and when they preach or read the several lessons or recite hymns all are appropriate to the day and afterwards when the dismissal from the church has been made they repair to the anastasis with hymns according to custom so that the dismissal takes place about the sixth hour and on this day lucanaria also takes place according to daily use three octave of the festival on the second day also they proceed in like manner to the church in golgotha and also on the third day thus the feast is celebrated with all this joyfulness for three days up to the sixth hour in the church built by constantine on the fourth day it is celebrated in like manner with similar festal array in eleona the very beautiful church which stands on the mount of olives on the fifth day in the lazarium which is distant about one thousand five hundred paces from jerusalem on the sixth day in zion on the seventh day in the anastasis and on the eighth day at the cross thus then is the feast celebrated with all this joyfulness and festal array throughout the eight days in all the holy places which i have mentioned above 
and in bethlehem also throughout the entire eight days the feast is celebrated with similar festal array and joyfulness daily by the priests and by all the clergy there and by the monks who are appointed in that place for from the hour when all return by night to jerusalem with the bishop the monks of that place keep vigil in the church in bethlehem reciting hymns and antiphons but it is necessary that the bishop should always keep these days in jerusalem and immense crowds not of monks only but also of the laity both men and women flock together to jerusalem from every quarter for the solemn and joyous observance of that day four the presentation mass the fortieth day after the epiphany is undoubtedly celebrated here with the very highest honor for on that day there is a procession in which all take part in the anastasis and all things are done in their order with the greatest joy just as at easter all the priests and after them the bishop preach always taking for their subject that part of the gospel where joseph and mary brought the lord into the temple on the fortieth day and simeon and anna the prophetess the daughter of phanuel saw him treating of the words which they spake when they saw the lord and of that offering which his parents made and when everything that is customary has been done in order the sacrament is celebrated and the dismissal takes place for lent and when the paschal days come they are observed thus just as with us forty days are kept before easter so here eight weeks are kept before easter and eight weeks are kept because there is no fasting on the lord's days nor on the sabbaths except on the one sabbath on which the vigil of easter falls in which case the fast is obligatory with the exception then of that one day there is never fasting on any sabbath here throughout the year thus deducting the eight lord's days and the seven sabbaths for on the one sabbath as i said above the fast is obligatory from the eight weeks there remain forty-one fast days which they call here eote that is quadragesima one service on sundays now the several days of the several weeks are kept thus on the lord's day after the first cock crow the bishop reads in the anastasis the account of the lord's resurrection from the gospel as on all lord's days throughout the whole year and everything is done at the anastasis and at the cross as on all lord's days throughout the year up to daybreak afterwards in the morning they proceed to the greater church called the martyrium which is in golgotha behind the cross and all things that are customary on the lord's day are done there in like manner also when the dismissal from the church has been made they go with hymns to the anastasis as they always do on the lord's day and while these things are being done the fifth hour is reached lucanaria however takes place at its own hour as usual at the anastasis and at the cross and in the various holy places on the lord's day the ninth hour is kept two weekday services on the second weekday they go at the first cockcrow to the anastasis as they do throughout the year and everything that is usual is done until morning then at the third hour they go to the anastasis and the things are done that are customary throughout the year at the sixth hour for this going at the third hour in quadragesima is additional at the sixth and ninth hours also and at lucanaria everything is done that is customary throughout the whole year at the holy places and on the third weekday all things are done as on the second weekday three wednesday and friday again on the fourth weekday they go by night to the anastasis and all the usual things are done until morning and also at the third and sixth hours but at the ninth hour they go to zion as is customary at that hour on the fourth and sixth weekdays throughout the year for the reason that the fast is always kept here on the fourth and sixth weekdays even by the catechumens except a martyr's day should occur for if a martyr's day should chance to occur on the fourth or on the sixth weekday in quadragesima they do not go to zion at the ninth hour 
but on the days of quadragesima as i said above they proceed to zion on the fourth week day at the ninth hour according to the custom of the whole year and all things that are customary at the ninth hour are done except the oblation for in order that the people may always be instructed in the law both the bishop and the priest preach diligently but when the dismissal has been made the people escort the bishop with hymns thence to the anastasis so that it is already the hour of lucanaria when he enters the anastasis then hymns and antiphons are said prayers are made and the service misa of lucanaria takes place in the anastasis and at the cross and the service of lucanaria is always later on those days in quadragesima than on other days throughout the year on the fifth weekday everything is done as on the second and third weekday on the sixth weekday everything is done as on the fourth including the going to zion at the ninth hour and the escorting of the bishop thence to the anastasis with hymns four saturday but on the sixth weekday the vigils are observed in the anastasis from the hour of their arrival from zion with hymns until morning that is from the hour of lucanaria when they entered to the morning of the next day that is the sabbath and the oblation is made in the anastasis the earlier that the dismissal may take place before sunrise throughout the whole night psalms are said responsibly in turn with antiphons and with various lections the whole lasting until morning and the dismissal which takes place on the sabbath at the anastasis is before sunrise that is the oblation so that the dismissal may take place in the anastasis at the hour when the sun begins to rise thus then is each week of quadragesima kept the dismissal taking place earlier on the sabbath i e before sunrise as i said in order that the hebdomarii as they are called here may finish their fast earlier for the custom of the fast in quadragesima is that the dismissal on the lord's day is at the fifth hour in order that they whom they call the hebdomadarii that is they who keep the week's fast may take food and when these have taken breakfast on the lord's day they do not eat until the sabbath morning after they have communicated in the anastasis it is for their sake then that they may finish their fast the sooner that the dismissal on the sabbath at the anastasis is before sunrise for their sake the dismissal is in the morning as i said not that they alone communicate but all who are so minded communicate on that day in the anastasis five the fast this is the custom of the fast in quadragesima some when they have eaten after the dismissal on the lord's day that is about the fifth or sixth hour do not eat throughout the whole week until after the dismissal at the anastasis on the sabbath these are they who keep the week's fast nor after having eaten in the morning do they eat in the evening of the sabbath but they take a meal on the next day that is on the lord's day after the dismissal from the church at the fifth hour or later and then they do not breakfast until the sabbath comes round as i have said above for the custom here is that all who are apotoxicity as they call them here whether men or women eat only once a day on the day when they do eat not only in quadragesima but throughout the whole year but if any of the apotoxicity cannot keep the entire week of fasting as described above they take supper in the middle of the week on the fifth day all through quadragesima and if any one cannot do even this he keeps two days fast in the week all through quadragesima and they who cannot do even this take a meal every evening for no one exacts from any how much he should do but each does what he can nor is he praised who has done much nor is he blamed who has done less that is the custom here for their food during the days of quadragesima is as follows they taste neither bread which cannot be weighed nor oil nor anything that grows on trees but only water and a little gruel made of flour 
Quadragesima is kept thus, as we have said, and at the end of the week's fast the vigil is kept in the Anastasis from the hour of Lucanarii on the sixth weekday, when the people come with psalms from Zion, to the morning of the Sabbath, when the oblation is made in the Anastasis, and the second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth weeks in Quadragesima are kept as the first. End of section 9Section 10 of The Pilgrimage of Etheria by Etheria. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 5. Holy Week and the Festivals at Easter. 1. Saturday before Palm Sunday, Station at Bethany. Now, when the seventh week has come, that is, when two weeks, including the seventh, are left before Easter, everything is done on each day as in the weeks that are past, except that the vigils of the sixth weekday, which are kept in the Anastasis during the first six weeks, are in the seventh week kept in Zion, and with the same customs that obtained during the six weeks in the Anastasis. For throughout the whole vigil, psalms and antiphons are said appropriately appropriate both to the place and to the day. And when the morning of the Sabbath begins to dawn, the bishop offers the oblation, and at the dismissal the archdeacon lifts his voice and says, Let us all be ready today at the seventh hour in the Lazarium. And so, as the seventh hour approaches, all go to the Lazarium, that is, Bethany, situated at about the second milestone from the city. And as they go from Jerusalem to the Lazarium, there is, about five hundred paces from the latter place, a church in the street on that spot where Mary, the sister of Lazarus, met with the Lord. Here, when the bishop arrives, all the monks meet him, and the people enter the church, and one hymn and one antiphon are said, and that passage is read in the gospel where the sister of Lazarus meets the Lord. Then, after prayer has been made, and when all have been blessed, they go thence with hymns to the Lazarium. And on arriving at the Lazarium, so great a multitude assembles, that not only the place itself, but also the fields around, are full of people. Hymns and antiphons, suitable to the day and to the place, are said, and likewise all the lessons are read. Then, before the dismissal, notice is given of Easter, that is, the priest ascends to the higher place and reads the passage that is written in the Gospel, when Jesus, six days after the Passover, had come to Bethany, and the rest. So, that passage having been read and notice given of Easter, the dismissal is made. This is done on that day because, as it is written in the Gospel, these events took place in Bethany six days before the Passover, there being six days from the Sabbath to the fifth weekday, on which, after supper, the Lord was taken by night. Then all return to the city direct to the Anastasis, and Lucanaria takes place according to custom. 2. Palm Sunday. A. Services in the Churches. On the next day, that is the Lord's Day, which begins the Paschal Week, and which they call here the Great Week, when all the customary services from cockcrow until morning have taken place in the Anastasis and at the cross, they proceed on the morning of the Lord's Day according to custom to the greater church, which is called the Martyrium. It is called the Martyrium because it is in Golgotha behind the cross where the Lord suffered. When all that is customary has been observed in the great church, and before the dismissal is made, the archdeacon lifts his voice and says first, Throughout the whole week beginning from tomorrow, let us all assemble in the martyrium, that is, in the great church at the ninth hour. Then he lifts his voice again, saying, Let us all be ready today at Eliona at the seventh hour. So, when the dismissal has been made in the great church, that is, the martyrium, the bishop is escorted with hymns to the Anastasis, and after all things that are customary on the Lord's day have been done there, after the dismissal from the martyrium, every one hastens home to eat, that all may be ready at the beginning of the seventh hour in the church in Iliona, on the Mount of Olives, where is the cave in which the Lord was wont to teach. B. Procession with Palms on the Mount of Olives 
accordingly at the seventh hour all the people go up to the mount of olives that is to iliona and the bishop with them to the church where hymns and antiphons suitable to the day and to the place are said and lessons in like manner and when the ninth hour approaches they go up with hymns to the embonmon that is to the place whence the lord ascended into heaven and there they sit down for all the people are always bidden to sit when the bishop is present the deacons alone always stand hymns and antiphons suitable to the day and to the place are said interspersed with lections and prayers and as the eleventh hour approaches the passage from the gospel is read where the children carrying branches and palms met the lord saying blessed is he that cometh in the name of the lord and the bishop immediately rises and all the people with him and they all go on foot from the top of the mount of olives all the people going before him with hymns and antiphons answering one to another blessed is he that cometh in the name of the lord and all the children in the neighborhood even those who are too young to walk are carried by their parents on their shoulders all of them bearing branches some of palms and some of olives and thus the bishop is escorted in the same manner as the lord was of old for all even those of rank both matrons and men accompany the bishop all the way on foot in this manner making these responses from the top of the mount to the city and thence through the whole city to the anastasis going very slowly lest the people should be wearied and thus they arrive at the anastasis at a late hour and on arriving although it is late lucanaria takes place with prayer at the cross after which the people are dismissed three monday and holy week on the next day the second weekday everything that is customary is done from the first cock crow until morning in the anastasis also at the third and sixth hours everything is done that is customary throughout the whole of quadragesima but at the ninth hour all assemble in the great church that is the martyrium where hymns and antiphons are said continuously until the first hour of the night and lessons suitable to the day and the place are read interspersed always with prayers lucanaria takes place when the hour approaches that is so that it is already night when the dismissal at the martyrium is made when the dismissal has been made the bishop is escorted thence with hymns to the anastasis where when he has entered one hymn is said followed by a prayer the catechumens and then the faithful are blessed and the dismissal is made four tuesday in holy week on the third weekday everything is done as on the second with this one thing added that late at night after the dismissal of the martyrium and after the going to the anastasis and after the dismissal there all proceed at that hour by night to the church which is on the mount eliona and when they have arrived at that church the bishop enters the cave where the lord was wont to teach his disciples and after receiving the book of the gospel he stands and himself reads the words of the lord which are written in the gospel according to matthew where he says take heed that no man deceive you and the bishop reads through the whole of that discourse and when he has read it prayer is made the catechumens and the faithful are blessed the dismissal is made and every one returns from the mount to his house it being already very late at night five wednesday in holy week on the fourth week day everything is done as on the second and third week days throughout the whole day from the first cock crow onwards but after the dismissal has taken place at the martyrium by night and the bishop has been escorted with hymns to the anastasis he at once enters the cave which is in the anastasis and stands within the rails but the priest stands before the rails and receives the gospel and reads the passage where judas iscariot went to the jews and stated what they should give him that he should betray the lord and when the passage has been read there is such a moaning and groaning of all the people that no one can help being moved to tears at that hour afterwards prayer follows then the blessing first of the catechumens and then of the faithful and the dismissal is made six monday thursday a mass celebrated twice 
on the fifth weekday everything that is customary is done from the first cockcrow until morning at the anastasis and also at the third and at the sixth hours but at the eighth hour all the people gather together at the martyrium according to custom only earlier than on other days because the dismissal must be made sooner then when the people are gathered together all that should be done is done and the oblation is made on that day at the martyrium the dismissal taking place about the tenth hour but before the dismissal is made there the archdeacon raises his voice and says let us all assemble at the first hour of the night in the church which is in ediona for great toil awaits us to-day in this very night then after the dismissal at the martyrium they arrive behind the cross where only one hymn is said and prayer is made and the bishop offers the oblation there and all communicate nor is the oblation ever offered behind the cross on any day throughout the year except on this one day and after the dismissal there they go to the anastasis where prayer is made the catechumens and the faithful are blessed according to custom and the dismissal is made b night station on the mount of olives and so every one hastens back to his house to eat because immediately after they have eaten all go to eleona to the church wherein is the cave where the lord was with his disciples on this very day there then until about the fifth hour of the night hymns and antiphons suitable to the day and to the place are said lessons too are read in like manner with prayers interspersed and the passages from the gospel are read where the lord addressed his disciples on that same day as he sat in the same cave which is in that church and they go thence at about the sixth hour of the night with hymns up to the imbomon the place whence the lord ascended into heaven where again lessons are read hymns and antiphons suitable to the day are said and all the prayers which are made by the bishop are also suitable both to the day and to the place c stations at gethsemane and at the first cockcrow they come down from the imbomon with hymns and arrive at the place where the lord prayed as it is written in the gospel and he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast and prayed and the rest there is in that place a graceful church the bishop and all the people enter a prayer suitable to the place and to the day is said with one suitable hymn and the passage from the gospel is read where he said to his disciples watch that ye enter not into temptation the whole passage is read through and prayer is made and then all even to the smallest child go down with the bishop on foot with hymns to gethsemane where on account of the great number of people in the crowd who are wearied owing to the vigils and weak through the daily fast and because they have so great a hill to descend they come very slowly with hymns to gethsemane and over two hundred church candles are made ready to give light to all the people on their arrival at gethsemane first a suitable prayer is made then a hymn is said then the passage of the gospel is read where the lord was taken and when this passage has been read there is so great a moaning and groaning of all the people together with weeping that their lamentation may be heard perhaps as far as the city d return to jerusalem from that hour they go with hymns to the city on foot reaching the gate about the time when one man begins to be able to recognize another and thence right on through the midst of the city all to a man both great and small rich and poor all are ready there for on that special day not a soul withdraws from the vigils until morning thus the bishop is escorted from gethsemane to the gate and thence through the whole of the city to the cross seven good friday a service at daybreak and when they arrive before the cross the daylight is already growing bright there the passage from the gospel is read where the lord is brought before pilate with everything that is written concerning that which pilate spake to the lord or to the jews the whole is read and afterwards the bishop addresses the people comforting them for that they have toiled all night and are about to toil through that same day bidding them not be weary but to have hope in god who will for that toil give them a great reward 
and encouraging them as he was able he addresses them thus go now each one of you to your houses and sit down a while and all of you be ready here just before the second hour of the day that from that hour to the sixth you may be able to behold the holy wood of the cross each one of us believing that it will be profitable to his salvation then from the sixth hour we must all assemble again in this place that is before the cross that we may apply ourselves to lections and to prayers until night b the column of the flagellation after this when the dismissal at the cross has been made that is before the sun rises they all go at once with fervour to zion to pray at the column at which the lord was scourged and returning thence they sit for a while in their houses and presently all are ready c veneration of the cross then a chair is placed for the bishop in golgotha behind the cross which is now standing the bishop duly takes his seat in the chair and a table covered with a linen cloth is placed before him the deacons stand round the table and a silver gilt casket is brought in which is the holy wood of the cross the casket is opened and the wood is taken out and both the wood of the cross and the title are placed upon the table now when it has been put upon the table the bishop as he sits holds the extremities of the sacred wood firmly in his hands while the deacons who stand around guard it it is guarded thus because the custom is that the people both faithful and catechumens come one by one and bowing down at the table kiss the sacred wood and pass through and because uh, i know not when some one is said to have bitten off and stolen a portion of the sacred wood it is thus guarded by the deacons who stand around lest any one approaching should venture to do so again and as all the people pass by one by one all bowing themselves they touch the cross and the title first with their foreheads and then with their eyes then they kiss the cross and pass through but none lays his hand upon it to touch it when they have kissed the cross and have passed through a deacon stands holding the ring of solomon and the horn from which the kings were anointed they kiss the horn also and gaze at the ring all the people are passing through up to the sixth hour entering by one door and going out by another for this is done in the same place where on the preceding day that is on the fifth weekday the oblation was offered d station before the cross the three hours and when the sixth hour has come they go before the cross whether it be in rain or in heat the place being open to the air as it were a court of great size and of some beauty between the cross and the anastasis here all the people assemble in such great numbers that there is no thoroughfare the chair is placed for the bishop before the cross and from the sixth to the ninth hour nothing else is done but the reading of lessons which are read thus first from the psalms wherever the passion is spoken of then from the apostle either from the epistles of the apostles or from their acts wherever they have spoken of the lord's passion then the passages from the gospels where he suffered are read then the readings from the prophets where they foretold that the lord should suffer then from the gospels where he mentions his passion thus from the sixth to the ninth hours the lessons are so read and the hymns said that it may be shown to all the people that whatsoever the prophets foretold of the lord's passion is proved from the gospels and from the writings of the apostles to have been fulfilled and so through all those three hours the people are taught that nothing was done which had not been foretold and that nothing was foretold which was not wholly fulfilled prayers also suitable to the day are interspersed throughout the emotion shown and the mourning by all the people at every lesson and prayer is wonderful for there is none either great or small who on that day during those three hours does not lament more than can be conceived that the lord hath suffered those things for us afterwards at the beginning of the ninth hour there is read that passage from the gospel according to john where he gave up the ghost this read prayer and the dismissal follow 
e evening offices and when the dismissal before the cross has been made all things are done in the greater church at the martyrium which are customary during this week from the ninth hour when the assembly takes place in the martyrium until late and after the dismissal at the martyrium they go to the anastasis where when they arrive the passage from the gospel is read where joseph begged the body of the lord from pilate and laid it in a new sepulchre and this reading ended a prayer is said the catechumens are blessed and the dismissal is made but on that day no announcement is made of a vigil at the anastasis because it is known that the people are tired nevertheless it is the custom to watch there so all of the people who are willing or rather who are able keep watch and they who are unable do not watch there until the morning those of the clergy however who are strong or young keep vigil there and hymns and antiphons are said throughout the whole night until morning a very great crowd also keep night-long watch some from the late hour and some from midnight as they are able eight vigil of easter now on the next day the sabbath everything that is customary is done at the third hour and also at the sixth the service at the ninth hour however is not held on the sabbath but the paschal vigils are prepared in the great church the martyrium the paschal vigils are kept as with us with this one addition that the children when they have been baptized and clothed and when they issue from the font are led with the bishop first to the anastasis the bishop enters the rails of the anastasis and one hymn is said then the bishop says a prayer for them and then he goes with them to the greater church where according to custom all the people are keeping watch everything is done there that is customary with us also and after the oblation has been made the dismissal takes place after the dismissal of the vigils has been made in the greater church they go at once with hymns to the anastasis where the passage from the gospel about the resurrection is read prayer is made and the bishop again makes the oblation but everything is done quickly on account of the people that they should not be delayed any longer and so the people are dismissed the dismissal of the vigils takes place on that day at the same hour as with us nine services in the easter octave moreover the paschal days are kept up to a late hour as with us and the dismissals take place in their order throughout the eight paschal days as is the custom everywhere at easter throughout the octave but the adornment of the churches and the order of the services here are the same throughout the octave of easter as they are during epiphany in the greater church in the anastasis at the cross at eleona in bethlehem as well as in the lazarium in fact everywhere because these are the paschal days on the first lord's day they proceed to the great church that is the martyrium as well as on the second and third weekdays but always so that after the dismissal has been made at the martyrium they go to the anastasis with hymns on the fourth weekday they proceed to Iliona, on the fifth to the Anastasis, on the sixth to Zion, on the Sabbath before the cross, but on the Lord's day, that is, on the octave, they proceed to the great church again, that is, to the martyrium. Moreover, on the eight paschal days, the bishop goes every day after breakfast up to Iliona with all the clergy and with all the children who have been baptized and with all who are apotoxity, both men and women, and likewise with all the people who are willing. Hymns are said and prayers are made both in the church which is on Iliona, wherein is the cave where Jesus was wont to teach his disciples, and also in the Embomon, that is, in the place whence the Lord ascended into heaven. And when the psalms have been said and prayer has been made, they come down thence with hymns to the Anastasis at the hour of Lucanaria. This is done throughout all the eight days." 10. A Vesper Station at Zion on Easter Sunday. Now, on the Lord's Day at Easter, after the dismissal of Lucanaria, that is, at the Anastasis, all the people escort the bishop with hymns to Zion, and on arriving, hymns suitable to the day and place are said, prayer is made, and the passage from the gospel is read, 
where the Lord on the same day and in the same place where the church now stands in Zion came in to his disciples when the doors were shut. That is, when one of his disciples, Thomas, was absent, and when he returned and the other apostles told him that they had seen the Lord, he said, Except I shall see, I will not believe. When this has been read, prayer is again made, the catechumens and the faithful are blessed, and every one returns to his house late, about the second hour of the night. 11. Sunday after Easter again on the octave of easter that is on the lord's day all the people go up to eleona with the bishop immediately after the sixth hour first they sit for a while in the church which is there and hymns and antiphons suitable to the day and to the place are said prayers suitable to the day and to the place are likewise made then they go up to the embomon with hymns and the same things are done there as in the former place and when the time comes, all the people and all the apotactitic escort the bishop with hymns down to the Anastasis, arriving there at the usual hour for Lucanaria. So Lucanaria takes place at the Anastasis and at the cross, and all the people to a man escort the bishop thence with hymns to Zion. And when they have arrived, hymns suitable to the day and to the place are said there also, and lastly, that passage from the gospel is read, where on the octave of Easter the Lord came in where the disciples were, and reproved Thomas because he had been unbelieving. The whole of that lesson is read with prayer afterwards. Both the catechumens and the faithful are blessed, and every one returns to his house as usual, just as on the Lord's day of Easter, at the second hour of the night. 12. Easter to Whitsuntide now, from Easter to the fiftieth day, that is, to Pentecost, no one fasts here, not even those who are apotactity. During those days, as throughout the whole year, the customary things are done at the Anastasis from the first cockcrow until morning, and at the sixth hour, and at Lucanaria likewise. But on the Lord's days, the procession is always to the martyrium, that is, to the great church according to custom, and they go thence with hymns to the Anastasis. On the fourth and sixth weekdays, as no one fasts during those days, the procession is to Zion, but in the morning. The dismissal is made in its due order. 13. The Ascension Festival at Bethlehem on the fortieth day after Easter, that is, on the fifth weekday, for all go on the previous day, that is, on the fourth weekday, after the sixth hour, to Bethlehem, to celebrate the vigils, for the vigils are kept in Bethlehem, in the church wherein is the cave where the Lord was born. On this fifth weekday, the fortieth day after Easter, the dismissal is celebrated in its due order, so that the priests and the bishop preach, treating of the things suitable to the day and the place, and afterwards every one returns to Jerusalem late. End of section 10「Section 11 of the Pilgrimage of Etheria by Etheria. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 6. Festivals of Whitsuntide 1. Whitsunday, A. Morning Stations But on the fiftieth day, that is, the Lord's Day, when the people have a very great deal to go through, everything that is customary is done from the first cockcrow onwards. Vigil is kept in the Anastasis, and the bishop reads the passage from the gospel that is always read on the Lord's Day, namely the account of the Lord's resurrection, and afterwards everything customary is done in the Anastasis, just as throughout the whole year. But when morning is come, all the people proceed to the great church, that is, to the martyrium, and all things usual are done there. The priests preach, and then the bishop, and all things that are prescribed are done, the oblation being made, as is customary on the Lord's day, only the same dismissal at the martyrium is hastened, in order that it may be made before the third hour." b station at zion 
and when the dismissal has been made at the martyrium all the people to a man escort the bishop with hymns to zion so that they are in zion when the third hour is fully come and on their arrival there the passage from the acts of the apostles is read where the spirit came down so that all tongues were heard and all men understood the things that were being spoken and the dismissal takes place afterwards in due course for the priests read there from the acts of the apostles concerning the self-same thing because that is the place in zion there is another church there now where once after the lord's passion the multitude was gathered together with the apostles and where this was done as we have said above afterwards the dismissal takes place in due course and the oblation is made there then that the people may be dismissed the archdeacon raises his voice and says let us all be ready to-day in eleona in the embomon directly after the sixth hour c station at the mount of olives so all the people return each to his house to rest themselves and immediately after breakfast they ascend the mount of olives that is to eleona each as he can so that there is no christian left in the city who does not go when therefore they have gone up the mount of olives that is to eleona they first enter the embomon that is the place whence the lord ascended into heaven and the bishops and the priests take their seat there and likewise all the people lessons are read there with hymns interspersed antiphons too are said suitable to the day and the place also the prayers which are interspersed have likewise similar references the passage from the gospel is also read where it speaks of the lord's ascension also that from the acts of the apostles which tells of the ascension of the lord into heaven after his resurrection and when this is over the catechumens and then the faithful are blessed and they come down thence it being already the ninth hour and go with hymns to that church which is in eleona wherein is the cave where the lord was wont to sit and teach his apostles and as it is already past the tenth hour when they arrive lucanaria takes place there prayer is made and the catechumens and likewise the faithful are blessed d night procession and then all the people to a man descend thence with the bishop saying hymns and antiphons suitable to that day and so come very slowly to the martyrium it is already night when they reach the gate of the city and about two hundred church candles are provided for the use of the people and as it is a great distance from the gate to the great church that is the martyrium they arrive about the second hour of the night for they go the whole way very slowly lest the people should be weary from being afoot and when the great gates are opened which face towards the market-place all the people enter the martyrium with hymns and with the bishop and when they have entered the church hymns are said prayer is made the catechumens and also the faithful are blessed after which they go again with hymns to the anastasis where on their arrival hymns and antiphons are said prayer is made the catechumens and also the faithful are blessed this is likewise done at the cross lastly all the christian people to a man escort the bishop with hymns to zion and when they are come there suitable lessons are read psalms and antiphons are said prayer is made the catechumens and the faithful are blessed and the dismissal takes place and after the dismissal all approach the bishop's hand and then every one returns to his house about midnight thus very great fatigue is endured on that day for vigil is kept at the anastasis from the first cockcrow and there is no pause from that time onward throughout the whole day but the whole celebration of the feast lasts so long that it is midnight when every one returns home after the dismissal has taken place at zion two a resumption of the ordinary services now from the day after the fiftieth day all fast as is customary throughout the whole year each one as he is able except on the sabbath and on the lord's day which are never kept as fasts in this place 
On the ensuing days, everything is done as during the whole year, that is, vigil is kept in the Anastasis from the first cockcrow. And if it be the Lord's Day, at the earliest cockcrow, the bishop first reads in the Anastasis, as is customary, the passage from the Gospel concerning the Resurrection, which is always read on the Lord's Day, and then afterwards hymns and antiphons are said in the Anastasis until daylight. But if it be not the Lord's Day, only hymns and antiphons are said in like manner in the Anastasis from the first cockcrow until daylight. All the apotacity and of the people those who are able attend. The clergy go by turns daily. The clergy go there at first cockcrow, but the bishop always as it begins to dawn, that the morning dismissal may be made with all the clergy present except on the Lord's Day, when the bishop has to go at the first cockcrow, that he may read the gospel in the Anastasis. Afterwards everything is done as usual in the Anastasis until the sixth hour, and at the ninth, as well as at Lucanaria, according to the custom of the whole year. But on the fourth and sixth weekdays, the ninth hour is kept in Zion, as is customary. 7. Baptism 1. The Inscribing of the Competence Moreover, I must write how they are taught who are baptized at Easter. Now he who gives in his name gives it in on the day before Quadragesima, and the priest writes down the names of all. This is before the eight weeks which I have said are kept here at Quadragesima. And when the priest has written down the names of all, after the next day of Quadragesima, that is, on the day when the eight weeks begin, the chair is set for the bishop in the midst of the great church, that is, at the martyrium, and the priests sit in chairs on either side of him, while all the clergy stand. Then, one by one, the competents are brought up, coming, if they are males, viri, with their fathers, and if females, feminae, with their mothers. Then the bishop asks the neighbors of every one who has entered concerning each individual, saying, Does this person lead a good life? Is he obedient to his parents? Is he not given to wine, nor deceitful? Making also inquiry about the several vices which are more serious in man. And if he has proved him in the presence of witnesses to be blameless in all these matters concerning which he has made inquiry, he writes down his name with his own hand. But if he is accused in any matter, he orders him to go out, saying, Let him amend, and when he has amended, then let him come to the font, lavacrum. And as he makes inquiry concerning the men, so also does he concerning the women. But if any be a stranger, he comes not so easily to baptism, unless he has testimonials from those who know him. 2. Preparation for Baptism, Catechizings this also I must write, reverend sisters, lest you should think that these things are done without good reason. The custom here is that they who come to baptism through these forty days, which are kept as fast days, are also exorcised by the clergy early in the day, as soon as the morning dismissal has been made in the Anastasis. Immediately afterwards the chair is placed for the bishop at the martyrium in the great church, and all who are to be baptized sit around near the bishop, both men and women, their fathers and mothers standing there also. Besides these, all the people who wish to hear come in and sit down, the faithful, however, only, for no catechumen enters there when the bishop teaches the others the law. Beginning from Genesis, he goes through all the scriptures during those forty days, explaining them first literally, and then unfolding them spiritually. They are also taught about the resurrection, and likewise all things concerning the faith during those days, and this is called the catechizing. 3. Traditio of the Creed then, when five weeks are completed from the time when their teaching began, the competents are then taught the creed, 
and as he explained the meaning of all the scriptures so does he explain the meaning of the creed each article first literally and then spiritually by this means all the faithful in these parts follow the scriptures when they are read in church inasmuch as they are all taught during those forty days from the first to the third hour for the catechizing lasts for three hours and god knows reverend sisters that the voices of the faithful who come in to hear the catechizing are louder in approval of the things spoken and explained by the bishop than they are when he sits and preaches in church then after the dismissal of the catechizing is made it being already the third hour the bishop is at once escorted with hymns to the anastasis so the dismissal takes place at the third hour thus are they taught for three hours a day for seven weeks but in the eighth week of quadragesima which is called the great week there is no time for them to be taught because the things that are described above must be carried out four reditio recitation of the creed and when the seven weeks are past and the paschal week is left which they call here the great week then the bishop comes in the morning into the great church at the martyrium and the chair is placed for him in the apse behind the altar where they come one by one a man with his father and a woman with her mother and recite the creed to the bishop and when they have recited the creed to the bishop he addresses them all and says during these seven weeks you have been taught all the law of the scriptures you have also heard concerning the faith and concerning the resurrection of the flesh and the whole meaning of the creed as far as you were able being yet catechumens but the teachings of the deeper mystery that is of baptism itself you cannot hear being as yet catechumens but lest you should think that anything is done without good reason these when you have been baptized in the name of god you shall hear in the anastasis during the eight paschal days after the dismissal from the church has been made you being as yet catechumens cannot be told the more secret mysteries of god five mystic catechizings but when the days of easter have come during those eight days that is from easter to the octave when the dismissal from the church has been made they go with hymns to the anastasis prayer is said anon the faithful are blessed and the bishop stands leaning against the inner rails which are in the cave of the anastasis and explains all things that are done in baptism in that hour no catechumen approaches the anastasis but only the neophytes and the faithful who wish to hear concerning the mysteries enter there and the doors are shut lest any catechumen should draw near and while the bishop discusses and sets forth each point the voices of those who applaud are so loud that they can be heard outside the church and truly the mysteries are so unfolded that there is no one unmoved at the things that he hears to be so explained now forasmuch as in that province some of the people know both greek and syriac while some know greek alone and others only syriac and because the bishop although he knows syriac yet always speaks greek and never syriac there is always a priest standing by who when the bishop speaks greek interprets into syriac that all may understand what is being taught and because all the lessons that are read in the church must be read in greek he always stands by and interprets them into syriac for the people's sake that they may always be edified moreover the latins there who understand neither syriac nor greek in order that they be not disappointed have all things explained to them for there are other brothers and sisters knowing both greek and latin who translate into latin for them but what is above all things very pleasant and admirable here is that the hymns the antiphons and the lessons as well as the prayers which the bishop says always have suitable and fitting references both to the day that is being celebrated and also to the place where the celebration is taking place eight dedication of churches those are called the days of dedication when the holy church which is in golgotha and which they call the martyrium was consecrated to god the holy church also which is at the anastasis that is in the place where the lord rose after his passion was consecrated to god on that day 
the dedication of these holy churches is therefore celebrated with the highest honor because the cross of the lord was found on this same day and it was so ordained that when the holy churches above mentioned were first consecrated that should be the day when the cross of the lord had been found in order that the whole celebration should be made together with all rejoicing on the selfsame day moreover it appears from the holy scriptures that this is also the day of dedication when holy solomon having finished the house of god which he had built stood before the altar of god and prayed as it is written in the books of the chronicles so when these days of dedication are come they are kept for eight days and people began to assemble from all parts many days before not only monks and apotoxidae from various provinces from mesopotamia and syria from egypt and the thebaid where there are very many monks and from every different place and province for there is none who does not turn his steps to jerusalem on that day for such rejoicing and for such high days but lay people too in like manner both men and women with faithful minds gather together in jerusalem from every province on those days for the sake of the holy day and the bishops even when they have been few are present to the number of forty or fifty in jerusalem on these days and with them come many of their clergy but why should i say more for he who on these days has not been present at so solemn a feast thinks that he has committed a very great sin unless some necessity which keeps a man back from carrying out a good resolution has hindered him now on these days of the dedication the adornment of all the churches is the same as at easter and at epiphany also on each day the procession is made to the several holy places as at easter and at epiphany for on the first and second days it is to the greater church which is called the martyrium on the third day it is to eleona that is the church which is on that mount whence the lord ascended into heaven after his passion and in this church is the cave wherein the lord used to teach his apostles on the mount of olives but on the fourth day dot 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 end of section eleven end of the pilgrimage of etheria by etheria